Sorry about that. That's okay. There's too many people moving and shaking around here. You can't really keep track of who's doing what. On September 16th, 2016, Elizabeth Wetlofer made a confession to killing patients under her care. She had a history of troubled and failed romantic relationships. She had access to prescription medication, to which she also became addicted to the point that it severely impacted her job. She had also been treated for bipolar disorder, for which she was placed on antidepressants and antipsychotics. A registered nurse who had worked both in facilities and private homes, Wetlofer ultimately killed eight people and attempted to kill six others in a span of 10 years. It is likely without her confession, she would have gone on to kill more. So, um, so yeah, like I said, um, I'm, I'm just going to go through for everything in this room is audio and video recorded first right. off. Are you okay, okay with that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to go through, like I said, a couple formalities, cover a few little things off, things that I have to do on my end that I, I, I right. need to do, and uh, things that I just want to tell you and make sure that we're all on the same page before we, uh, before we get going. Okay. Okay. So, first off, um, today is Wednesday, October the 5th, 2016, and on my phone right now, I'll just use that as a, a time reference, it's 514, okay. so 1714, we'll just use that as a start time of our conversation here today. Um, again, my name is Nathan Hergott with the Woodstock Police Service, I currently work in our crime unit, okay. and uh, we met a short time ago in downtown Toronto, correct? Yes. Right? Yes. So, um, we came to a facility where you've spent the last uh, few weeks, from what I understand, yeah. And uh, we met with Dr. Khan and, yeah. and his team of uh, associates, yeah. and I believe you're under his care for the last little while, correct? Yeah, for the last three Okay. And uh, the process, how, how we got here basically is um, kind of offered you a ride back, and, and so we could have this conversation, and, and you gracefully accepted, and uh, off we went down uh, the 401, or the, well, the, the gardener, the QW, yeah. and, and the 403, and, 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 and here we are. Right. Um, so just to make it clear for whoever might watch this in the future, um, we didn't force you to come with us. We didn't, uh, you know, shove you in the car and off we went kind of thing. You did it yeah. on your own free will and, and you accepted it on your own uh, on your own decision making. Yeah. Is that no. correct? Yes. Yeah. I had a nap and you even let me try to give money to the homeless people. But. There you go. I remember all that. I remember all that. So I, I know I read you a few things before um, as we were kind of just cruising down Spadina there. Um, and I know you've been read this many times, but it's just things that we need to just reiterate and, and make sure that you're clear and comfortable with, okay. with having this conversation today. Okay. Okay. Um, like I said, um, based on our investigation, there could be some, some pretty serious criminal charges that result of, yeah. of our investigation. Okay. Yeah. So having said that, if, if you wish to speak to a lawyer at any time, okay. Unlike most people brought in for questioning, not only is Wetlofer cheerful and cooperative, she is ready to make a full confession. This reaction is more in keeping with someone who has uncharacteristically committed a crime of passion and is unable to live with guilt, but it also occurs in those with some type of mental illness and want to get caught to keep them from going on to commit more crimes. I don't want you to hesitate. We can make it happen whenever you like. So okay. whether it's now, five minutes from now, an hour from now, or three days from now, whatever the case may be. We're not going like, to be asking questions for three days, are we? I hope not. I hope <laughs> okay. not. I'm, just, dude, I'm just saying that any time that you want to speak to a lawyer, that you're kind of in our company or whatever the case may be, you let us know and, and we can make that accommodation for okay. you. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Okay, because you, in your position uh, as a Canadian citizen, you, uh, you're entitled to have free legal advice from a legal aid, okay. uh, duty counsel lawyer, a lawyer of your choice, whoever you like. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and like I said, because there could be some criminal charges that, that result of our investigation. Right. Okay. Um, also, and I know you've been read this many times before, that you may be charged uh, with many criminal offenses, um, and you don't have to say anything in answer to the charges that you face. But if you wish to do so, um, we're going to do that today. Um, but whatever you do say could be used. In, in course, and I know we had that conversation in the car on the way, on the yeah. way uh, back to Woodstock, yeah. and I asked you to repeat it in your own words, and you kind of gave us a few, uh, a few of, of describing it in your own vocabulary. As you said something like, "It's not Vegas. What happens in the car on the way back doesn't necessarily stay in the car." Right? Yeah, so the same thing, same thing in this room. Anything that you okay. say and everything that we talked about could be used as evidence at court. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, kind of to put it easily, the same rules apply. 
Okay. okay. Um, and if you've spoken to any other police officers, I know that you've dealt with uh, the Toronto police officers. Toronto, yeah. uh, there was uh, a couple officers in the car on our, on our trip back here. Um, if anyone's persuaded you or tried to push you into making a statement, whatever they said, I don't want that to influence no. you in any way. Okay. No, what I'm about to, to say is I'm giving up my own free will. Okay. All right. And I appreciate that. Um, and we'll get moving forward. For another few things, and I know that we said this in the car, you are not under arrest right now. Okay. Okay, I want to make that very clear to you. Okay. Okay, you're not under arrest. The door is unlocked. Okay, I'm not impeding your way to the door. If you want to leave at any time, if you want to stop talking to me at any time, you just let me know. And, okay. uh, and we'll just carry on from there. Okay. Okay, but you're not being held here against your will. Uh, we're not yeah. forcing you to speak to us. Um, we just have some follow-up, some uh, some follow-up questions from the investigation that kind of okay. got going while you were in Toronto. Yeah, being interviewed is hard because it takes so long. It does. Um, so I'll do my best. Like if, like I said, if I have to get up and pace around a bit or whatever. If you want to take a break at any time, you let us know. If you want to get up and pace around, I'll just kind of hang tight here and yeah. and we'll just keep conversing as long as uh, as long as you're comfortable. Um, I'll go as long as I can. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, that's kind of all the formalities, but, but like I said, those are the, the things that I just wanted to make sure that were, were clear to you. And if you have any questions for me before we get started, <coughs> the floor is yours. Is there no. anything or any concerns that you have? No, I just, I want to get through this and find out what happened to my mom and dad, because I know they're upset because someone went to visit them today. Okay. And I visited them today, and they said, you know, they're here, we're concerned, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine that, and I honestly don't have those answers for you, okay. but I can get them for you. Um, okay. My role in this investigation so far has been not as in depth as some of the other officers, um, okay. but my my task today obviously was to travel to Toronto and, and meet with you with with my fellow co-workers, yeah. and uh, and come back here and, and have a conversation. So that's kind of where where I'm at right now, but I can definitely get those okay. answers for you, and, and I don't want to upset any more people that need to be, uh, especially your mom and dad. Yeah. Okay. You should have bought blue, t blue t tickets when you were there. You know what? If I could afford them for the playoffs, I probably would have. Yeah, that was exciting last night. Um, so just just for the record, and I know you you prefer to go by Beth is what you told yeah. me. Is that correct? Yeah. Can you just state your full name for me? Elizabeth Tracy May Wetwalfer. Tracy May? Yep. Okay, and just spell your last name for the record. W-E-T-T-L-A-U-S-E-R. Okay, perfect. Um, and Beth, the reason why we're here today is because uh, we've received some information uh, back at the end of last week um, with regards to um, some information that was provided to the Toronto Police Service, mm -hmm. um, which has led us into uh, quite a bit of work and, and we can share today to speak to you with regards to kind of how this all started and, and yeah. follow up. But basically, um, I've, I've watched your statement that you provided to Toronto. Okay. Okay. And we've been provided uh, this document here. Does that look familiar? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And from what I can see here, there's four pages of a uh, handwritten document. Is that your handwriting? Yes, it is. Okay. And it just kind of goes through um, some people that you've encountered in, in your career uh, from 2007 through to... While it's understandable that Detective Hergott has to make absolutely sure that there is no question that this is being a forced confession, it is frustrating how long the process takes, even when she has stated that she is there on her own free will to make her statement. 2016 of August, yeah. uh, August of 2016, okay? So so that's kind of the, the focus of our investigation right now, is right. the information that you, you've put on these four pieces of paper. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but before we get into that, I just want to kind of get an idea of, of your career and, and where you've kind of where you've been in your career and um, kind of how you got into things and registered nurse. I started from call. I started from with from uh, here in Park uh, Secondary School. I um, <clears throat> I graduated grade thirteen, one free year of law school. Not law school, sorry, journalism school. Okay. And uh, then I uh, went to uh, Bible College, yeah. London Baptist Bible College in London. Graduated with a degree in uh, counseling, with a bachelor's degree in counseling. 
and then um, discovered that that's not gonna be wasn't really gonna get me a lot as far as work wise and career wise and so I went back to uh, Huron Park High School for a year and I took a year of math and sciences and went on to um, Conestoga College and in, in uh, they have it's in Kitchener but they have Stratford campus so I went there for the three years. Okay. And then when I graduated there I worked in a place called Geraldton. Okay which is 16 hours north of Toronto. I was going to say, that's quite a bit north, isn't it? Three hours north of Thunder Bay. Yeah, that's way up there. Yeah. Um, worked there, couldn't stand the isolation, moved back. Worked for um, an organization called uh, Christian Horizons here in town in one of their group homes till 2007, um, at which time... Um, my marriage fell apart in February 2007, and uh, I met a woman online, okay. and she decided to move to be with me. Okay. So um, I ended up quitting the job I was at and going to Crescent Care to make a little bit more money because I was the only pregnant earner. Mm -hmm. So I started working at Crescent Care, um, I believe it was June 2007. And how long did you work there for? Until um, 2014. Okay. Yeah, till uh, like, I think it was March 2014. And were you always in the same role? Or as did a, you as different a roles at Carson Care? Or? As a registered nurse. Yeah. And registered nurse's role is always the same. Yeah. As Wetlaufer is giving her work history, it is interesting to note that she is leaving out pertinent details. She has dealt with substance abuse problems for years, which has impacted her work. Once she was found passed out drunk in the basement during a night shift, and another time she made a medication error while high that nearly resulted in the death of a patient. She has also stolen medication. Perhaps she will go into these issues at a later point, or maybe she feels like she is already going to be confessing enough without having to dredge up every negative aspect of her life. But, um, I worked in different areas of the home. Okay. There's five wings to correct the care, so I worked in different areas. Right. Okay. All throughout the, the seven or so years that you were there? Yes. Okay. And at that point, did you have different supervisors from unit to unit, or uh, no, was there was, the same person? Or? There was one supervisor, Helen Crombie, she was the head nurse. Okay. And then there was, like, people under her, um, Shelly, uh, Jeanette, I don't remember the rest of them. And then there was like a, an administrative head. And I think for most of that time it was Brenda. Right. Okay. Um, and then from Crescent Care, I know you've, you've had a few other... Yeah, I went from Crescent Care, fired from Crescent Care. Okay. For a medication area, era, okay. er, error. Yeah. Then from there I went to uh, Meadow Park Nursing Home. Okay. And uh, left there to get help with an um, addiction issue, okay. hoping that it would get help with that as well. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back, I started working again in January. I left, I left Meadow Park in uh, September of 2014, and I started working for a... Um, Wetlaufer does bring up her addiction problems, although she makes them sound less severe than they were. Still, given what she is there to confess to, she probably thinks that it doesn't matter all that much in the long run. Nursing agency called uh, Lifeguard in 2015, and I worked with them for over a year, and then in July 2016, I started working for St. Elizabeth Healthcare. Okay. As well, I was still working for um, Lifeguard. Oh, okay. And how did that work? Did you just split your time between the two, um, or was it just kind of a part-time position at both organizations? It was, St. Elizabeth was my priority. Okay. So, and Lifeguard is very much, you pick up the shifts as they come. There's very few scheduled shifts, so gotcha. 
I can say yes or no to them and, and focus on saying no to this. And were, and were those roles where you would do like in home care with different um, clients? With uh, Lifeguard, it's an agency, so you go into nursing homes, you go into people's homes, you go into um, you go into uh, like retirement homes. Um, you did a lot of different things, a lot of one on ones with people, mm -hmm. like in their own homes, mm -hmm. twelve hour shifts, eight hour shifts, okay. sitting with them. Okay. A lot of stuff I did was sitting with palliative patients. Right. Okay. That would be tough. I, hey, it was okay. Yeah. Like, because I knew they were going to die. Yeah. And it was just an opportunity to give the family a rest. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, it's an important role. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't see it that way and wouldn't even notice the care that these people are giving from people like yourself, right? Um, yeah. To give the families a bit of a break and, and to take, take, take that role is, is important, which a lot of people don't see, right? Because so. when, some, when someone's dying in the house, mm -hmm. Families don't want everyone to be asleep at once, right? And that can That's be right. very hard if you're not able to do that. That's right. But if you have a nurse there that says, no, it's okay, I've got this, I know the medications they get, it's going to be all right, then... Everyone kind of rest easy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, back at Meadow Park, what, were you, what was your addiction? Uh, hide and rest. Okay. All right. Hide and rest. Okay. And what, like, how much were you using? And when asked directly, Wetlaufer is surprisingly straightforward about her addiction and how she illegally obtained the medication. It's starting to look as though she really does intend to make a full confession. This may also suggest that she won't try to hide any of her past victims, which will be helpful in fully determining the extent of her crimes. I was a binge user, so okay. I would use what I could get a hold of okay. by stealing it from the patients. Okay. All right. And how would that work? Like, would, it, would it just be in their, in their allotted medications, or would you have access to a card to, um, to feed your dinner? There's, or some, <clears throat> there's some in their allotted medications. Some of them had um, confusion, so they couldn't tell the difference between what pills you were giving them, so I could give them a lot of them instead of their hiding more. Okay. Um, there was uh, a lot of them had as needed, so it would be in a big card, mm -hmm. and then they'd say, I would just punch out that, oh, Barney needed two of those today, and oh, Billy needed three of those today when they really didn't. Okay. And that's how I would get a hold of it. Okay. Every once in a while, there was also a um, drug book, a dr big drug uh, holder, like a safe almost, that we would put the drugs in. Okay. Once, uh, like, if somebody dies, yep. and there were, like, 23 hydromarks left, we'd slide the whole card into the drug holder. Well, if you picked it up and turned it upside down and shook it, you'd get drugs back out of it. Okay. Right. So. so you had your ways? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and was that ever uh, an issue with, with Stadler? Were you ever confronted? Or, or I that, was did that go totally undetected for the, the time you were there? There was a time when um, Hydromorph was delivered to the home and it didn't get put away right away by the person who should have. And so I took the hydromorph and put it in my bag and took it home. And it wasn't discovered for months. Okay. And uh, so I just played down. When the police told me about it, I played down. Yeah. And that was that? Yeah. Okay. Right. So as a binge, a binge user then, like how much would you would you be using on a, I mean obviously you wouldn't use it on a daily basis if you were binge yeah. using, but like how long did the addiction last for? Oh, the addiction lasted from I think it started in 2008, okay. so to 2014, at which time I went away and got treatment at a treatment center. Okay. But then uh, I started using again, probably from January 2016, I started using again. Okay. And are you still using when you get your hands on them? Or? No, oh. no. I'm, uh, I'm going to stop using alcohol as well. I'm going to, I have friends in AA and I'm, I've got a very clear plan. I think if, if I'm able to be out and about, right. I have a very clear plan. And I also know if I'm not able to be out and about, that AA and Narcotics Anonymous do have some programs where they come into prison. Absolutely. 
hard to believe that Wetlaufer thinks that there is even a possibility that she will be able to remain free unless she thinks that she will be able to make some sort of plea for diminished capacity or temporary insanity. So, yeah. that's my plan. Well, that's, that's good that you have a plan. Um, what do you think? What do you think the reason is that you slipped into the addiction back in the week? Is it just the stresses of the job that you're facing, yeah, or dealing yeah, with just, your personal life as well? And just always feeling like I had to be the best possible person in this very, very stressful job, giving medications to 32 people, um, making sure treatments were done on 32 people, right. charity procedures, 32 people, supervising four PSWs who sometimes didn't always get along. And sometimes always didn't always get along with me. Yeah. Um, it's a hard job. Any I nurse will say it's a hard job. I believe it 100%. And uh, then they would add different things like, oh, you have to do this and that to say who's here and counting the medications at the end of the shift. And it was a hard job. And, and I, I just, I always was putting this pressure on myself to be a really good nurse and to do everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, when I could get a hold of a hydromark or two and take it, then that pressure was gone. Right. And um, the treatment center that you went away to, where was that? I cannot remember. Okay. I've tried and tried to remember. Yeah. Um, was it local or? No, it was, a, it was at a town that was like two, a good two hour drive. Okay. You know where the locks are? Yeah. Near Niagara Falls. Welland. Welland? Yeah. It's a little town outside of Welland. Okay. And it, they have a, it's an 18 day treatment that they have and I, I was successful. I went through the whole thing. Nice. So all 18 days? Yes. Okay. And it helped? Yes. Yes. Okay. What about family? You are born and raised with some? Yeah, born and raised in Woodstock, uh, married from 2000 and, uh, from 97 to 2007. Okay. We broke up um, February 2007. No children. I wanted them, he never did. My mom and dad are in their 70s, 75 and 76. I have cousins all over the area. Um, and... Uh, my brother and his wife and four kids, they live in uh, Okay. And they're, um, well, they're, they're quite active. The oldest one is 26 and he's got a, a wife and two kids. He lives with his parents. They all live with the parents except for my... Oh, is that right? Yeah, just one big yeah. house of crazy. Family, huh? Have you been out to visit at all? Um, I've been to see their house once. Yeah. They've been here a few times. Nice. They came in 2013 for my parents' uh, 50th wedding anniversary. Nice. And um, my nephew and his wife stayed behind and lived with my parents for a few months while my nephew tried to go to Bible college. Okay. But he wasn't successful, so they went back. Yeah. So your brother older or younger than you? Older. Older. He's three years older than me. Although Wetlaufer makes mention of her ex-husband, she hasn't brought up her more current ex-wife, Sheila Andrews. This may be because they parted on bad terms. Andrews has claimed that Wetlaufer was childish and threw temper tantrums, and was unwilling to help in the care of her mother. This last point being something she may have eventually been thankful for once all of this was brought to light. Um. So as far as your latest position at um, St. Elizabeth, yeah. that was your last position as a RN, is that yes, correct? Yes, it was. Okay. Yeah. And you said you resigned from there? Yeah. Okay. What, what brought you to that? That's, that, that's where things get a little crazy. Okay. This is part that I haven't told the doctors. Um. Because it seems so stupid now. Mm -hmm. When my ex and I broke up in 2007, I was already taking the medication for my, for my borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And I was so angry. And it was like a voice said inside me, I'll use you, don't worry about it. 
and the different times that I have caused people's deaths or caused them discomfort through the um, through the influence. I believe it was the influence of that voice or whatever it was. It wasn't a voice in my head, it was a voice in here. And when I would do it afterwards, I would hear like a laughter in my chest. So, I started working for St. Elizabeth, and I was doing well, but it was a lot of pressure. And the way that, you know, that I've helped people to die has been through insulin. And uh, after my first, my 30-day evaluation, my, uh, my uh, supervisor came to me and said, you know, I'm really sorry. We want you for Woodstock, but we have so many kids in schools in Ingersoll that need help with their insulin pumps that you're going to start working in Ingersoll. Okay. And I panicked. I panicked. I didn't want to do that. Because I felt, you know, what if? Those are kids. So about, I think it was about a week after that that I quit. Yeah. And then I, uh, packed my stuff in the car and I drove two days into Co I drove into Quebec thinking like I would just sort of run away sort of thing. And then I thought, no, that's just stupid. So I came back and uh I was gonna tell my parents what was going on but they had visitors from Scotland. So I didn't tell them, I just <laughs> sorry. Spent two weeks pretending to go to work. Okay. Well, the ones that the dirtiest in Scotland were here. Right. It's funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> and then, um, once they left, I, did, I decided I didn't want to nurse anymore. I didn't want to hurt anybody anymore. So I also quit my other job. And then I decided, um, well, whatever Friday that was, that, like, I did a lot of looking into how I could get help. But I realized I needed help with whatever this was. Right. Because part of me had started to believe that it was the devil. Mm -hmm. And part of me thought it might be God with the purpose of my life. And uh, I know the doctor asked me those questions, but I didn't answer them because I was so ashamed. These are both very common delusions shared by other serial killers that fall under the description of Angel of Mercy. Some believe that they are saving the patient from a life of agony and inevitable death while others believe they are carrying out judgment. But I just, uh, I didn't want this to keep going on, so I quit both jobs. Looked into where I could get help. Dr. Fernando is my uh, psychiatrist, and he's not a very nice man. So I went on an online uh, support group and was talking on to people on there, and they were saying, you know, get some help. So then I started researching some uh, psych boards and stuff, and I saw CAMH, and they are the only um, mental health facility in Ontario that has an emergency department. Okay. So I made a decision, and I went I went there one Friday morning. I took the train, and off I went. And before I went, I told um, two I told three people what was going on. My uh, friend from AA, okay. and um, my uh, friend, uh, I told them what was going on, they said, yes, go and get help. And my friend drove me to the train station. And, and when you say you told them what was going on, did you get into the details I, of why you were going to that, seek help? Or? I told them that I had been killing people to get an insulin on the job. And they all said, yes, you better go get help. So off I went. Okay. And she's a friend from uh, when I used to work at. Okay. All right. Good last name. Um. Okay. And she drove you to the train station on uh, on, the on Friday, a Friday morning yeah. to the Woodstock train station. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um. And then your other friend is my cousin. Yeah, she lives in BC. Okay. 
And, I, and if you don't want to tell me, and that's fine based on the reason why this person may, or may not be a friend, but your AA friend. My AA friend, yeah. Okay. She's, her, I can tell you her first name, but okay. otherwise it's confidentiality. And, and, and I don't want to dig into that uh, at this point. That's, that's not a problem at all. Um, so did you disclose the same thing to all those three people? That I had been giving insulin overdoses. I didn't say why, because at that point I felt so stupid. Yeah. It, I, it just felt so stupid. And, and Beth, to be honest with you, I, I admire your the way that you're conducting yourself and, and telling us and having this conversation with me. I thank you for that. Um, and I'm not here to judge in any way. I know. So I don't want you to know that. And, and I'm not a doctor. I know you spent a lot of time at, at CAMH the last three weeks, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm far from a doctor, but I do appreciate you, you telling me uh, the truth and, and telling me uh, the way that these things happened and played out. Yeah. And, uh, and I admire you for that. And it's, you know, it's been a while because I've been stewing about, like, do I give the names of the people right. that I killed? Right. Because then here's eight families that thought that their family member died peacefully and normally, and they didn't, and what's that going to do to those families? Right. And even up to uh, going to the going to the hospital, I decided I was just going to give the first names. And uh, my cousin said, listen, they know what years you work there. If you don't tell them the exact names, they're going to go in there and go over every single file. And that's going to be even worse for the families there. Right. So that she was the one to give me that advice, to give the names. She shows an amazing grasp of the possible impact of her confession, but at the same time, it's very clear that Wetlaufer is suffering from mental problems. She has no real motive for these killings and hasn't derived any pleasure from the deaths. On the other hand, she knows what she has done is wrong and was always aware of that fact. And as far as you know, have these people reached out to any of police agencies where they may reside to, to notify that you told them this? Or no. did you tell them in, in kind of confidence? And, and I told them in confidence and they well. said they promised me they wouldn't tell anyone. Okay. But basically the, the implant was if I didn't get help, right. then they'd be on the phone the next day. Okay. I got you. So did you tell them basically then on I told them the like, Thursday? I told them the night before I went. Okay. So yeah. Thursday night? Yeah. And then you took off Friday morning? Yeah. It was risky for her friends to choose not to inform the police, since they could technically be considered accessories after the fact. Okay. So that's basically what they said was, you know, if you haven't gotten help Friday, then we're calling the police. We love you, but we're calling the police. Okay. Well, they just probably felt that they had an obligation, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A moral obligation or whatever they saw, right? Yeah. What medications are you on right now? I'm taking um, fluvoxamine, it's called Luvox, 200 milligrams. It's uh, anti-obsessional and an anti-depressant. Okay. I'm taking 300 milligrams of Seroquel, which is um, an antipsychotic. Okay. And they upped that when I was at KMH, Okay. which has really helped clear my thinking. Has it? Good. And then I'm taking a couple of blood pressure medications, and then I've got some loxapine for when I get really agitated. Okay. And when we left the hospital, you had taken, I believe, some Ativan, is that right? I took two milligrams of Ativan when we left the hospital. Right. Which okay. was, you guys noted the time, one yeah. thirty or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, and I've had nothing since. Okay. And I know that the doctor, uh, Dr. Khan, provided with, with a prescription. That, yeah. And he them. also gave me two loxapines. Yeah. And was very strict. I am not to take them until all the interviews are over okay. because they will start to interfere with my thinking. Okay. And then that's used to the interview. Yeah, exactly. And do you feel that you're of a, a clear sound mind right now? Yes, I do. Conversing with me in this in this room? Yeah. Okay. Yes, and, and everything that you're telling me is, is the truth and the best that you can remember? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I could... I can appreciate where you're coming from as far as the work that you, you went through. Um, obviously, I've never been a nurse and I've never worked in, in the profession that you that you did, but I could imagine how overwhelming it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, having a lot of responsibility, uh, maybe not having the support of, of the administration or your, or your supervisors, you know, just kind of 
go out and get it done, right? Yeah. And, uh, and that could be, I can see how that would be stressful and I can see how that would drive you maybe into your addiction and, and to other things. But um, I want to just go over this document, if that's okay, okay with you. Yeah. Okay, would you be willing to do that with me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you, you, you do your thing. Sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. Absolutely not. This is pretty, excuse me, major. I've only ever had parking tickets. I've never been arrested for anything. Well, like I said, you're not under arrest right oh, now, I know. but it is, uh, it is a very significant investigation you're right. I understand. And like I said before, Beth, I, I do appreciate you uh, speaking with us. And I can imagine that, uh, does it feel like a weight off your shoulders? Yes. So yes you've been yes. carrying a burden for quite some time. And I've tried to get help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes it takes a few attempts to, to finally commit to it, right? Yeah, I had a pastor that I told him, he prayed over me and told me I'd be fine. And that was God's grace. And then When was that? That was... Uh, Halloween 2013. Okay. Yeah. And you, you kind of told us what had happened to, your, to you at, at that point in your life with yeah. involving these people? Yeah. Okay. And where was that? That was here in town. Okay. Do you want his name? Actually, if you want to tell me, it's up to you. No, sorry, it wasn't. Did I just say 2014? Mm -hmm. It was 2013. Okay. okay. All right. So, so be before we get into this, um, I know that there's a statement which we have and that I've watched where you attended the police station in Toronto, at the yes. 52 Division. Is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And I honestly get. I think it was Detective Hamilton, and I honestly can't remember the other detective's name. Now I know it started with an A. Um, and you met with them for, uh, uh, I was going to say about an hour and a half. That was not. Yeah. <laughs> and at that point, you had in your possession um, a photocopy of this document, yes. right? Okay. And you went through and you read it out. Yes. Okay. And then following that, they started uh, with the first name on the list, and they wanted to just try and get a little bit more detail of, yes. of, of the involvement in each circumstance. Okay. Each death, right? Okay. That's what I'd like to do today, and just give some more detail. Okay. Okay. So. It's a long list. It is. It is, but I think that to, you and I, I think we can get through it together. Yeah, I'm and, sure we can. I've only been patient with me. I, I've got all the time to look. Okay. I'm not going anywhere. Because I'm physically comfortable. It's a nice chair, but. Yeah. Well, anytime enough. you need to get up and wander around, if you like, I said, if you want to take a break, and uh, have me leave and just kind of stretch your legs and whatever the case may be, you go ahead. Okay. okay. If you have to use your washroom at any time, just let me know. All right. Okay? Because like I said, I'm I'm here as, as long as we need to be. Okay. Okay? And I'm not pressuring you to uh, to stay any longer than you want to. But I think that, uh, I think if we just kind of sit down and go through this, like I said, we'll get through it together. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm a pretty patient person, and I'm here to just listen to what you have to tell me, okay? Okay. Okay. And like I said, I, I appreciate it. Okay? So, um... How about we just do this together? I'll just bring this over okay. here. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So I, I'm not going to have you read through this entire document because I've already ha you already did that, right? I have written it. I have read it. I have you know lived it. So yeah, absolutely. So Mr. Silcox. Detective Hergott finally begins questioning Wetlaufer about her victims, starting with James Silcox. Although he was first to die from her injections, she had already given overdoses to several patients. Although two of those later died, she was only charged with aggravated assault in their deaths. Yes. Okay, September of 2007. Yeah. Okay. The first one that died as a result of what I did. Okay. And, and before you get into that, you have signed some kind of page numbers, all that kind of stuff on yeah. these documents. So we'll just go in order of, of how you've written it, okay? And I know that the detectives in, uh, in Toronto kind of had this in their possession and just kind of got you to recall some things. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to keep it here because, I mean, you've already written this out, so yeah. what's on here is we already know that. Um, I just have some follow-up questions okay. just with regards to each circumstance. So, Mr. Silcox, um, it says here you were working at a double shift uh, from 3 to 7, right? 3 p.m. to 7 a.m. Right. Okay. And this was at Crescent Care? Yes. 
Okay, in Woodstock. Yes. Okay. And tell me about your your knowledge of, of James and, and your daily interactions during your shift with him. Um, I didn't see him every time. He wasn't always my patient. I just knew from what uh, people had said that he would grab the, the nurse's uh, breasts and buttocks and he would say horribly inappropriate things about his wife that now he was there, you know, um, he was going to fuck all of us. She was going to fuck all of us. Uh, and just would say different things. And he did touch me inappropriately once. And where was that? On, on your breast. Body? On your breast. Okay. And were you alone in the room at that point? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, did he have a roommate at all? Did you have I, a roommate? I, he must have. He wasn't in the same room. So he was either in a double room or a quadruple room. Would you remember any other residents that would be roomed with him at that time? Or? No. No. Okay. no. That's okay. Um, what portion of the home would, would, was James in at this point? He was in the, okay, the east wing, the south wing, north wing. He was in the north wing, mm -hmm. about halfway down, and he was either in a double bed or a quadruple bed. The, the diagnosis of of his health at the, at the time you were caring for him, do you remember? He was post hip surgery and he had dementia. Do you remember how old he was approximately? No, I don't. I didn't see his face. In the 80s? Yeah. Okay. While Silcox wasn't diabetic and there was no reason to give him insulin, he did have dementia. The elderly and disabled are perfect targets for this sort of crime because they are usually unable to advocate for themselves, and family members are likely to trust caregiving professionals. And, sorry, he was not a diabetic? Not a diabetic. And, sorry, you said he had dementia? Yes. Okay, which you've also noted here as well, right? Yes. Okay. So tell me about the night. Uh, was this the first person that you did this to? That I, that I tried. Well, there were other people that had done it too who didn't die. Prior to James? Prior to James. Okay, and are he's they documented on here? He's the first one who died. Right. Back here? But there's some other... People who didn't die. Right, so I can't read that first name. I Clotilde, Clotilde Adriana. Okay, so that was... I mean, they're both September oh, 2007, but that was yeah. before James? Yeah. Okay. So, was this your first attempt at, at overdosing these people on insulin? Yes, Clotilde was. And I didn't really want her to die. I just, I don't know, I was just angry and um, had this sense inside me that she might be a person that God wanted back with them. Okay. And is that that feeling you're referring to that you had in your stomach yeah. sometimes? Yeah. Okay. Is that is that the point, and I hate to get off to a topic here, but the point where you had these feelings in your stomach and almost that laughter after it happened, Yeah. is that the part that you didn't tell Dr. Khan? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to be clear on that. I told him about the laughter in my stomach, but not the feeling that this might be the person that God wants. Okay. Okay. The, I just found it so stupid. It's your feelings, right? Mm-hmm. I honestly felt like God wanted to use me. And he kept, Dr. Khan kept asking me, do you think God chose me for a special purpose? I kept saying no, because that did not sound like a special purpose. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but yeah, I just had a sense after my marriage broke up that God was going to use me for something. And then after a while, I started to really wonder after some of the murders, if it was God or if it was the devil fooling me. Did you feel like you were doing the right thing for these people? No. No. I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do, but it wasn't what was right for them. Um... So James, then um, it was an evening that this one took place, right? Yeah. Um, it says here at about 9:30. Yeah. Run me through. About 9:30, I gave him a dose of uh, 50 milligrams of insulin. He's not not diabetic, so I went into it. I used a borrowed insulin pen, borrowed insulin, and gave him an insulin shot. And at 3:30. The PSW, well, throughout the night he was yelling out, I love you, and I'm sorry, and not to, not to me, but just you could hear him calling out in his room, and that's what he was calling out. Mm -hmm. And then at 3.30, the uh, PSWs came to me and said that he was gone. So, I did what we're supposed to do. I went and listened to his heart and chest, called the doctor, called the family, because that's what they wanted. Family came in to sit with him for a while. 
doctor came in and uh, said that his cause of death was from um, an embolism due to his uh, post hip. He'd had a he'd had surgery. hip surgery. Okay. Doctor ruled an embolism due to post hip surgery. Um, who do you think he was talking to when he was yelling, I, I love you? I thought it might be his, his family. Okay. I really did. And when they came in and talked to me, they wanted to know if he'd said anything. Right. So I told them that I was so ashamed. Yeah. So ashamed. Yeah. When you were speaking with the family? Yeah. Okay. And is that the, uh, the family that kind of commended you for the work that you had done? And yeah, that I've been there for him. Yeah. How does that make you feel? Awful. Absolutely awful. How did you deal with it? Um, I just went home and went to bed. You know, I felt awful. Maybe I fought with my girlfriend. Did some exercising, you know. Yeah. Played some games on the computer and just tried to forget about it. Did you have a, uh, have a problem sleeping that night at all? Or, you know, um, or did you? Well, I was working nights, so I was... Um, you were during the day then? Um, I would say I tossed and turned a bit, yeah. I felt pretty bad. And I didn't want to see the family again. So I tried to make sure I wasn't working when they came to pick up his stuff and I wasn't. And what room? Do you remember the, like a room number or just like you no, said? No, it was down in our phone. The wing, yeah. Okay. When you in, where did you get the insulin from for James, for Mr. Stilcox? You said you had taken some insulin. Um, and where did you get those? The insulin was kept in a fridge in the medication room. We had two medication rooms. And so it was kept in the fridge in the medication room. And uh, extra pens were kept in the drawer. So you could just say somebody you had someone admitted and you needed a pen in a hurry. So you just put the insulin in the pen and, and put the needle on and dial up the dose and give it. And how was that documented to know that, so that Carson Care would know that you were taking that insulin? They didn't keep track of insulin. Okay. This shows very poor security measures taken by that facility. Each dose should be carefully documented, no matter the inconvenience. It may seem extreme and tedious, but it's the only way to prevent something like this from happening. So it was just uh, something that was available for the nurses' use when they knew that it was appropriate for the certain patients. Yes, now each patient has their own insulin. Right. And maybe somebody noticed, somebody may have noticed that a lot of insulin was missing. Yes. A lot was used, but I was always careful to use different people. Okay. Different people's insulin? Insulin, yes. Okay. All right. And Mr. Silcox, then, where, where did you inject the insulin into his body? I'm not really sure. I'm going to say his arm or his uh, torso. And did he know what was going on at that point? Not really. Was he, uh, was he a verbal patient? Like, could he could converse oh, yeah. with you he, and he communicate? He didn't really converse. He did a lot of yelling out. I don't really remember him reacting when I gave it to him. So, he didn't react? I, I don't remember him reacting, no. Okay. Would he maybe just think it's a, a regular portion of his day and Probably. receiving the medications that he, he so required? Probably, so he had dementia. Um, his wife and daughter loved him a lot. Mm -hmm. And how does that make you feel? Crappy. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, like I said, he could be a bit of a handful, but, you know, he ate and drank normally, he took his pills when he told him to, mm -hmm. so nothing else I can really remember about him. But this is, you know, Nine years ago. So. It's a while ago. Yeah. Okay. How long after, sorry, when did you break up with your, your husband? Like I broke this, up was with it him. August 27, 2007? Oh, no, no. I broke up with him in the uh, end of January, beginning of February 2007. Okay. Okay, so it was quite some time until September until you actually. Yeah. All right, I guess. By that time, I was in a new relationship with a woman. Okay. Who was that? Her name was Maureen. Um, did you ever disclose to her what you were doing? No, absolutely not. So you just kind of went about your thing with Mr. Silcox? Yeah. Um, went home that 
day did you finish some exercise in the computer games went to sleep? Did you work again that next day? I don't remember. Don't remember. Do you remember who you would have been working with on that occasion? No. No? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. Are you okay? Yeah. You want to get yeah. up and stretch? I just do a lot of fidgeting. Okay, that's okay. Hey, you're not bothering me. I just want to make sure that you're comfortable. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. If I need something, I'll do it. Okay. You betcha. Do you remember who your supervisor would have been at that point? Well, that would be Helen Conway. That was the head nurse? Yeah, she was always, like, whoever was on as the nurse was the charge nurse. Okay. So I was the charge nurse. Mm -hmm. And at night, so I, as the charge nurse from 3 to 11, I was in charge of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 PSWs. Mm -hmm. And I was a... Yeah, and then there was two other wings, and so at night, as a church nurse, I was responsible to look after the um, RPN on the other side, like the urethra server. Okay. There were four PSWs on that side and four PSWs on my side, so nine people. Okay. And then Mrs. Conway, of course, she was around with me. Okay. She's she, okay. Yeah. yeah, but she's who we held. She's who we all answered to. She was her and the executive director, Brenda, I don't remember her last name. I'm sorry, I'm probably gonna task out for this today. That's fine. So as far as Mr. Silcox goes then, besides what you were feeling in your stomach, and besides that you thought that this was a purpose that you were given on from your relationship for after breaking up with your husband, right? Yeah. That you, that you, you, you indicated that he wasn't a very nice man. No, he wasn't. Did, is that a portion of um, what happened? I don't know. Okay. I wonder if that's a portion of how I chose him. Mm -hmm. And afterwards I did feel a release and a relief. Mm -hmm. Like a relief of pressure. Okay. Because throughout this document and, and as we go through it, a lot of these people... Although Wetlawfer describes many of her victims as not very nice people, she doesn't really describe her reasoning. It is possible that she subconsciously decided that they weren't nice people to justify herself that it was all right to kill them. You kind of describe them as, as not very nice people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's a tendency or a pattern that we see as far as is that why you chose these people? Yeah, I'm not. It might be, but I also know I just felt like they were the ones. Right. I had a feeling inside that they were the ones. Before before you injected insulin to Mr. Silcox, was it a spur of the moment thing? Had you thought about it that uh, when you reported for duty at three o'clock in the afternoon? Um, I started thinking about it about six at night, I think. Okay. And do you remember who the pronouncing doctor would have been? No. Like how, did that, how did that process work? That process, the way it worked was a uh, person found with no vital signs. Nurse goes in with a stethoscope, mm -hmm. listens for one minute. If there's no heartbeat, no uh, lung sounds, nurse goes and calls the doctor on call. Okay. Um, there was also a sheet that we had to fill out if we thought it was a coroner's case. Mm -hmm. In this case, I don't believe we thought it was. And then... Um, Family is called, and the doctor may wait to come in and uh, pronounce in the morning. Oh, okay. Family can come in and visit the body at any time, okay. so then the PSWs would get the the body ready. Okay, so prior to the doctor announcing in the morning, the family could come in and yeah. spend time? Yeah, so the PSWs would just clean them up, put on, uh, you know, clean, clean bridges and right. clean up the bed and stuff. Right. So you said... You said, Mr. Silcox, you said we didn't think it was a coroner's case. Who, who, who's it? Oh, what had that been? I guess I'm using the royal we. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. So would that be just a decision that you, you were trusting um, to make? No, there's a, there's a form okay. on the computer, and you go down through it, and if it says, if you take off anything that says yes, you notify the coroner. Okay. All right. But you would have clicked off those boxes yourself? Yes. Okay. So obviously, knowing that you had done this to Mr. Silcox, did you feel that you wouldn't click yes so that attention wouldn't be drawn to you? You know, I honestly can't remember if he was a coroner case or not. Okay. He might have been. 
Now with insulin, it's I would I even though I did this to these people when I did their. Let's see, it's, it's phrased as, does anyone have a reason to believe that this death was not natural? Right. So, yeah, I would click, I wouldn't click that one. If I right. Some, yeah. Okay. All right. This seems like an unethical and dangerous loophole when it comes to a case like this where someone is murdered by a doctor, nurse, or caregiver. One has to wonder how many more such cases have slipped by as natural causes or accidents. And I just wanted to clarify that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was just a question. Okay. Um, anything else you can think about from Mr. Silfox? No. Okay. Maurice, how did you pronounce Maurice's last name? Grenat. Is it Grenat? Okay. So tell me a little bit about Maurice. This says that this occurred in September or, or October of 2018. Yeah. Uh, sorry, 2007. And yeah. this was at present care? Yeah. Okay. Tell me a little yeah. bit about your interaction with Maurice. He was another one who liked to grab breasts and asses. Okay. He was sometimes a, a patient of mine. See, at that time, I wasn't, I didn't have a set floor that I worked on. I worked on all the different floors of the nurse, kind of filling in. Okay. So, uh, he, one afternoon I was working with him and he did grab me. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I got that feeling inside that this is his time to go. So I gave him an overdose of insulin after supper, and uh, I believe he died the next day. And what was your shift that do you remember? What shift it you was three to morning? eleven. Three p.m. Yeah, to eleven p.m. To eleven p.m. So, so he died. Shift? He died when I wasn't there. Okay. And he was known for it says you're grabbing this ass breast and asses. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And do you remember who you would have been working with at that point? No. Okay. Do you remember um, where Maurice was within Crescent Care? Yeah, he was down in the north wing. I think he was in a, in a double room on the right-hand side. Okay. Yeah. And do you remember who and his then, roommates would have been at all? No, I don't. But I do remember that when he started going downhill after the insulin overdose, they moved him to the palliative care room right by the uh, nurse's desk. And at what point of the day do you think that you, sorry, I think you said this already, but just to confirm what, what time of the day do you think it was when you had injected him with the injection? Um, it was afternoon, I think it was 4.30, 5.30. Okay. All right. Um, and what was his reaction to receiving the insulin? Again, it was just kind of like, oh, okay. I just said, the doctor wants you to have vitamin shot. That's what I usually say. And was he able to communicate with you verbal? He was, with he was verbal. Could converse? Not totally, but he could say something, yeah. Okay. Um, and did he question his vitamin shot at all? No. Um, and he passed away the next day? Yeah. Okay. So, being that you weren't there when he had passed away, you wouldn't have been the one checking the boxes. That's right. So, you know, by chance, what nurse would have been responsible for uh, Mr. Burnett? No, I don't. No? No. Okay. Did you ever have any concerns that he didn't pass away while you were working and that, you know, this issue may arise? No, I know I didn't. I, well, yes, I did a little bit. I always wondered if they'd find the site where I gave the shot and something, you know, they, there'd be an investigation. I always wondered that. Right. But I not, no. And even though it, it, it passed through your mind, did you just and continued just, on about your duties? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And do you remember what part of the body he would have been injected in? Oh, maybe the leg. Because at that point he didn't have a lot of body fat, so... Maurice didn't know. He didn't know. And when you get a, a subcutaneous injection, it goes in to the body fat, so... And you documented that he was a cancer patient? Yes. Okay. Do you remember what type of cancer he had? I think it was prostate. Prostate? Prostate, yes. Yeah. Okay. And what was the what did the outcome uh, hold for his future as far as the, the cancer in his body? He was dying. Awesome. How old do you think Maurice was? 75, 76. All right. I'm sorry, he was in a double room? Yeah, I believe it was a double room, yeah. 
during the Rubio we've been working with that day. Mm -hmm. Same supervisor for the head nurse. Yeah. Sorry, I'm like, That's okay. it's so far. It, it's a long time ago. Yeah. I mean obviously it's a significant event in your life, but it's a yeah. long time ago. Yeah. So I, I no I'm not I don't I'm not concerned that you can't remember every question that I ask you. That's you just if you can do the best that you can, that's all I can ask for. Okay. Okay. Whitlover continues to answer the question as best she can. While she isn't making any effort to lie, she is naturally having trouble remembering the details from so many years ago. Um, anything else you can remember about uh, Maurice at all? Not really, no. No? Okay. Do you there know if he was a coroner's case? There were people who loved him, that's what I remember. I don't know if he was a coroner's case. Who loved Maurice? Who did you know that would he come had, visit him? He had friends that would come visit him. That were like family friends. Mm -hmm. A man and a woman, that's all I remember. And how did it make you feel when, when Maurice passed away? Not good. And what happened from there? Just I just, uh, well, I wasn't there when he passed away. I, d I didn't work that day. Do you remember if you worked the next day? I might have. I know when I found out that he died, I love to see how long it took him. I get rid of the notes and stuff to see what it got. Okay. And just getting a point out to fit it with. Yeah, no problem. Whatever you need. So after you found out he had passed, you kind of read through the documents and. Yeah. Do you remember seeing anything that kind of said, oh, you know. No. This isn't a good thing for me or. No. Okay. So. And even if I had, I couldn't have altered them. You could have or could Could not. Okay. Um, the next person on your list is Helen Matheson. Yeah. Okay. So you go from September or October to 07. Yeah. And then Helen was 2011. Yeah. What What happened between those years? I think um, you'll see that they... Was there some attempts? Attempts. Um, okay. In 08 and 09? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we'll get to those. Yeah. Okay. Helen, I don't remember a lot about. She was very quiet, very determined. Um, just seemed to be waiting to die. Mm -hmm. Again, I had that feeling that, you know, this is the one. Mm -hmm. And um, I made a bit of a fuss about her that night because she was very lucid. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how much she liked blueberries, pie, and ice cream. Okay. So on my, on my break, I went to uh, Walmart. I got a small blueberry pie and some ice cream. Mm -hmm and brought it to her, and she ate three or four bites. Yes. And then that night I overdosed her. Because, like I said, I had that feeling that it was her time to go and... What do you mean by that? Do you think she was towards the end of her life at that point? No, that she was the person to go to. Okay. And that was in your mind, in your stomach? Yeah, Where was that feeling? In my chest in area. Chest. After I did it, I got that laughter. When would you feel that laughter? Would you feel it right after you injected it or once the person passed away? Um, both. Yeah. Both. Okay. And Helen was, uh, you state here that she wasn't a diabetic? No. Okay. Just out of curiosity, how much insulin would it take to kill someone See, that know. wasn't a diabetic? Or I don't know. You don't know that? No. So it's kind of hitting that. You didn't know that as a nurse that this amount? Or no, there is no set amount. Okay. And I'm just, I, I, I just yeah. simply just don't know that yeah. answer. Yeah, there is no set amount. Okay. All right, so different people would react differently to different amounts, is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and would it obviously make a difference if they were diabetic or not a diabetic? Yeah. This means that her death count had the potential to be much higher. Wetlaufer attempted this with at least six other people, and it was only through the random nature of their body's response to the insulin that they survived. I believe she died the next day. And it said, uh, I have not here, the doctor declared her to be a palliative, and she died two days later. Two days later, okay. And do you remember how much insulin that you had given out? 60? I don't know. And where would you have gotten that from? From, from the same supplies same. I always get it. Okay. Do you remember where Helen was in, in Crescent Care? Yes, she was on the south wing, and probably about four doors down from the nurse's station in a double room on the right-hand side. If you were facing the end, she was on the right-hand side. Um, you 
not saying a lot of negative things about Helen here. Did you did you get along with her okay? Did she ever do anything to, to harm you or No, no, she was very quiet. It was just I got that feeling that this you know, she's an exit to time so And uh, her health at that point, what was her diagnosis? She was um I couldn't tell you her diagnosis, just that she was she didn't get out of bed a lot and she had to be fed her food and fed her pills. So she was she was near her end of the life. How old do you think Helen was when this happened? This day about eighty five or eighty six. And do you remember what doctor would have were you there when she passed away the two days later? I don't think so. You don't think so? So you won't wouldn't be which which doctor pronounced her even no. too sure. Once I gave the insulin overdose, unless I was there for the shift that died, I just kind of laid low and didn't, you know, have anything to do with them. So, so if you issued an insulin injection to somebody, Helen, for instance, do you remember where Helen was injected? Probably her arm. Okay. Um, so, do you remember if she had a reaction at all? A reaction? Do mm -hmm. you know if she confronted you and what you were doing at all? Was she able to... She might have said, ow. Was she used to getting insulin or needles? I don't know if she was. Okay. All right. Um, but she wasn't combative or, or mm -hmm. she didn't confront you and ask you what you were doing? No. Unlike her descriptions of her previous two victims, Helen was female, quiet, and didn't seem to cause any trouble for Wetlaufer. Without any trait or action to connect these people, it makes it harder to look back through Wetlaufer's work history to find any sort of problem. And given the fact that she mostly worked around elderly and terminal patients, it could take ages to go back and look into each death that occurred wherever she worked. And, and you said once once you gave them their insulin? Did... You just, I just kind of... I tried to stay away from it. Sometimes I was very interested to see what was happening. Mm -hmm. I would just try to stay away from it. Okay. Would you ever go back into their rooms if while they were still alive to see kind of how they were progressing through the? If they were, if they were my, if they were my uh, charge, yes, I had to. Okay. Even though you had attempted to take their lives. Yeah. Okay. And you would. Um, what kind of symptoms would they show? Is it different for everyone? Or? Um, well, usually they'd get very diaphoretic, red. Um, they could lose consciousness. They'd shake. Some people, um, one person had a seizure. I think it was just one person. Mm -hmm. Two people stroked right out. Right after receiving the... Not the right after, but they stroked out. Over time. Actually, three people, because they believe James stroked it as well. So. Mr. Stokos. Mr. Stokos, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, November 2011. Mm-hmm. Mary Zerlinski, is that yeah. how you recall uh, her last name being pronounced? Yeah. And this was at Crescent Care? Yeah. Okay, and you said that she wasn't a diabetic, but she had dementia? That's right. But she could talk and communicate a lot. Mary could. Yeah, she was she was uh, feisty. Was she? Yeah. She I didn't know. hurt the nurses or anything. She was just very outspoken and feisty. And one night she said, "You know, I'm gonna die tonight." Mary said that. Yeah, and I said, "Oh," and she said, "Yeah, why don't you get me into the why don't you get me into the deathbed so I can die?" And I said, "Are you sure?" And she said, "Yeah, put me to bed. I'm gonna die." So I. I said, okay, and I went to the other nurse that was working with me, and uh, she said, oh, okay, well, let's put her in the side of the care room if that's what you want. So we did, and then I thought, well, she must be the next one. Mm -hmm. I had a feeling inside of me she must be the next one. Because she was saying she was going to die, but there's no signs she was going to die. So I gave her an overdose of insulin. And she became palliative and she died. I think within a couple of days. Many people say that they are going to die soon, or that they want to die, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they actually want to. Or more accurately, they may think that they want to during a moment of pain, but then that feeling passes. Many patients under her care were also suffering from dementia and other disorders that affect the mind, and so were not able to give consent, 
even if euthanasia had been a legal option. Yeah, so she's tied in that stuff. I mean, it's what you can all go here, but... Um, Which one has the vodka in it? <laughs> no answer from him. Um, so... Um, where was that in relation to where she was? Like, where was Mary and, and Chris? She and was down the south wing, a couple of rooms down from the, the uh, down from the nurse's office. And, uh, she, yeah, so she, we did put her in the pie, I bed. And would that be a decision that you would make or someone else would have to make? Together we made it. Okay. But um, a supervisor yeah. wouldn't have to say, okay, no. go ahead and... No, we have... We had enough autonomy that if we thought someone was um, palliative, we could call the doctor, tell them what was going on, mm -hmm. move, them, move the person to the palliative bed, mm -hmm. and get orders for palliative care. Okay. Okay. And do you remember how much insulin you would have given Mary? I think she may have been the first person that I gave long acting and short acting to together. Okay. I think. And can you just, well, besides the actual obvious, uh, in the uh, title of the, the actual drug itself, long acting and short acting, what was the biggest difference between the two? One one drops your blood sugar right away. The other um, starts working through your body and dropping it gradually over a long period of time. It just keeps dropping it. Okay. And what would the combination of those two do together? Uh, Did you know? Much, I didn't know for sure, but I figured it would be much stronger than just the short acting. Right. Okay. Which makes sense. Yeah. You would know more than I would, but um, do you remember where you injected Mary? Uh, probably her arm. In her arm. And I told her I told her it was for her pain. And you know she was in a single room and double room. Well, we had moved her from the double room to the uh, palliative care room, right okay. in her corner from the nurse's office. So where did you inject her in the palliative bed or in her? the palliative bed? Okay. And she. She had vocalized to you that she thought that she was going to die that night. Yeah. So I thought, okay, she must be the one. When I gave the insulin, I got that feeling inside in the laughter. Has she ever said something to, like, something to you before about wanting to die? Not like that. No, she was like, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die tonight. I'm being dead, I'm going to die. And that was new to you? Yes. Do you remember what shift you were working? Afternoon, 3 to 11. And about what time do you think you would have moved her into the pallet of bed and, and um, her? Might have been after supper, so about seven. And Mary ever dying to harm you or no. upset you in any way? No. No, she was fun. Okay. She was, so she was funky and, and outspoken. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you remember being present when she died? I don't think I was. And therefore, probably wouldn't be a part of checking the boxes. No, no, I didn't do the boxes for her. Who was there to see Mary on a regular basis? Who came to see Mary? I don't know. No. I don't know. Do you know if she had family? Um, maybe a son, but I don't know. And Mary being, we'll refer to her as your fourth victim. Yes. Not the fourth person that, uh, well, that you were successful in, uh, in these insulin injections. How did your emotions start to, to feel as um, it kept continuing? I kept having a lot of guilt. A lot of guilt. Um... This is an odd reaction for an angel of mercy. Usually they do not feel guilt since they do not see their actions as being wrong. They believe they have helped their victim and are serving some type of higher purpose. Mary, well, as you'll see, after Mary was Gladys and after Gladys there was a period of two years where I didn't do it. Three years where I didn't do it. What was going on in your life at that point? 
I was trying very, very hard to get close to God, to make sure that this wasn't Him, and to just live my life, read the Bible, go to church, and not do that, because I didn't want to do it anymore. So I tried very hard. I was still using a little bit. The hydro Yeah. And alcohol? Yeah. What was your drink of choice? Rye. Yeah. So I shouldn't say it like that, but I make it sound like it's... Yeah, rye. Would you? Rye and Baileys. Yeah. Yeah, pop a rye and pop down some water. Yeah. Yeah, rye and water. Okay. And, uh, typically how much would you, would you drink in a week? In a week? Probably about eight or nine. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, like shots of rye or? Uh, drinks. I don't know. Okay. I'm just not. Okay. If you're going to go buy shots, I know if there's no drinks, so like three times nine, 27. Okay. So like you'd be drinking triples? Yes. Okay. How would that make you feel with, in combination with the hydromorphs? And uh, I never did it with the hydromorphs. No? It was no, either one or the other? It was either one or the other. The, the booze was more just for one I didn't have, the hydromars. Mm-hmm. And if I was going out, but I didn't go out with people. I always went out mostly by myself and just, I took scratch and one tickets and took booze and yeah. I would drink and do my scratch one. Yeah. Okay. Um, a significant and disturbing as this may be to the people that are going to hear this and, and, and learn about this, obviously there's a lot of uh, families that we're going to contact yes. and, and speak to. Um, although this wasn't, and I hate to classify it into different areas, but these weren't necessarily violent deaths. Like, how did, Do you think these people died peacefully? Did they struggle at all? Um, all the people you've talked about so far died peacefully, in my opinion. And I am sorry. I'm sorry for what the families went through at the time, and I'm extremely sorry for what they're going to go through. It's awful. Wet lovers' remorse and the fact that they died relatively peacefully probably will not provide much comfort to the families. Not only will they have to deal with the fact that their loved one's life was cut short, but they will also always wonder if there was anything they could have done differently to prevent it. It will also cause them a great amount of stress the next time they have to put someone in a facility or go into one themselves. If you could say something to them, what would you say? What can you say to them? That would matter. Um, I'm sorry isn't enough. I should have gotten help sooner. Um, I took something from you that was precious and it was taken too soon. Um, I honestly believed at the time that God wanted me to do it, but I know now that's not true. And, uh, if I could take it back, if I could get help sooner, I would have. And that's story. Like I said, I admire you for everything. Whether it took one year, two years, ten years, whatever it took for you to finally get help, that's, that's a big step. Thank you. Right? I mean, you could have been in this situation and, and taken this to your grave. Yes. And who would have known? Right? That's what I was told to do by a lawyer. What's that? Take it to my grave and not tell anybody. So you've confided in a lawyer as well about this? A long time ago, yeah. Was it after all of these people? It, it was in 2014 before I... Uh, before you went to Welland? Or, yeah, sorry, to the, the Welland Center. Yeah, to the rehab facility center. So you spoke to a lawyer. I spoke to a lawyer. That she was the one who told me to get out. Um, I need to go to the bathroom. Okay. Mm-hmm. No. Just for the record, and uh, so it's documented. I have six twenty-six. Yeah. Let's take a break, okay? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Remember where you're going. Do you need anything else at all? No. You sure? No, I have a caramel. 
Oh, did you? Perfect. Um, just for the record here, I have <coughs> 6.30 and I will just resume things, okay? Okay. Take this to November of 2011 mm -hmm. at Crescent Care. Um, it says here Gladys was a type 2 diabetic um, and had dementia. Severe dementia. Did she? Yeah. How old do you think Gladys was? Nine, 92. 92. Okay. And where was Gladys within uh, Crescent Care? East Wing, um, three doors down from the main desk in a double room. Okay. Do you remember her roommates at all? No. no. Um, and and uh, obviously these are repetitive questions, and yeah. you might remember some of the roommates through uh, as we go along here. So that's why I just keep asking the same questions. Um. Hergot's questions also serve another purpose. If her details can be corroborated, it makes it less likely that she is giving a false confession. This is especially necessary in a case where so many families need to be notified to avoid undue emotional stress or lawsuits. Tell me a little bit about Gladys. What did she like when you um, cared for her? Well, when I first started caring for her, she was walking and talking, and she had quite the spirit. Um, she once <laughs> she once punched a man. Oh. Because uh, she, she overheard the nurses telling one of the gentlemen, "No, you can't push your wife around. You have to come with us." And she turned around and she said, "You can't treat a woman like that." Boom. And hit the man. And hit the man. <laughs> So then we're all in a state of trying to keep them from fighting with each other and trying to keep them from hurting us. So right. Yeah, she was oh. very smunky. But she went down downhill fast. Did she? Eventually, um, she was she had um, dementia, didn't take her pills well, didn't eat well, very stubborn woman. And uh, as always, one evening I just got that red surging feeling that she was going to be the one. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Gave her insulin overdose. Did you ever get that feeling outside of work? No, never. No? Did you ever get that feeling going to work, knowing that something was going to happen that shift? No, it always happened at work. So, if I were to use the phrase spur of the moment, would it be something that you would just have that feeling come on? Or yeah, I guess you could say it off of the moment, but it would it usually start happening, you know, focused on one patient, and then I would feel that red surging, which is what made me think it was God. Which I am so embarrassed. Like I said, I'm not here to judge you. Right? I know. Right? I know. Um, you said you explained that it was difficult for her towards the end of giving her her pills. Um, do you remember where you were working with uh, the shift when you injected glass? I believe I was working, I was either working nights or days. Okay. Because I know it was close to the end of my shift. Okay. And I did it, and the person who came on next shift, I think it was night. So the person who came on next shift checked her all over and started to call the doctor and had her made palliative and started her on a pain, pain regimen. And, and do you remember how much insulin you gave her? No, I don't. Do you remember if it was long or short or a minute? I, sh I probably, at that point, I think I was giving everybody a minute. Okay, so once once Mary was the first person you said yeah. that you gave the, the long and the short acting to, yeah. and then following that it was everybody. everyone from there yeah. forward. Okay. Um, and that was, a, again, a crescent care. Yeah. Was that insulin taken from the same location as, yeah. as you always would? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Were there cameras in, in, in the bedroom? No. No? No. Nothing at all? No. So you could access whatever you like and... Well, not whatever you like, but yeah. But the insulin, reason, because the you insulin, said they didn't even keep track of um, it. The insulin, uh, yeah. The insulin, um, you could get volume, you could get, like, injectable volume. Um, yeah, it was fairly easy to take meds from there. Hopefully they have implemented stricter protocols, because the gross negligence that made it easier for these people to be killed is appalling. Um, 
I'm sorry, I was going to ask a question about waiting to get down the road. Um, do you know how long it took for Gladys to die? I believe she died the next afternoon, or that afternoon. And do you know if you were present for that? No, I was not. So therefore, it wouldn't have been a part of the, the process of, of the pronouncing and checking the box? No, no. Um, when someone's dying, it seems like it takes longer than it does. If you're around, if you know what I mean. I do. Yeah. So. I'm sorry that you don't know. Thank you. Um, as far as Gladys goes, do you remember if you worked the next day to, to learn about Gladys' death? Or? Um, I think I worked two days later. Okay. I think I worked the day after her death, whenever that was. What would play through your mind on, on your days where you inject, so glass, for instance, you inject her, uh, you work nights, it says here, so yeah. 11 till 7, you did this at 5 o'clock, you go home and carry it on about, if you have one, two, three days off, whatever yeah. the case was, what was going through your mind on those I days off? Were you thinking, when yeah. when Gladys going to die? I would wonder if she had died. I would wonder, you know, if this would be the time I would get caught, you know, what was I going, every time... Every time I walked in after somebody passed away, I always wondered if this day I'm going to get caught. Mm -hmm. What kind of consequences play through your head? Like if you, if, damn, I'm, I'm caught in the gig up. What, what kind of consequences do you think you're going to face if, if that were to happen Fired. back in 2011? Fired. Jail. Um, no more nursing license. That's exactly what I'm looking at now. Although I took myself out instead of being fired, but right. still and no more alert nursing lessons. As, as far as in 2011 though, and, and, and having that feeling, like when did those feelings start to say uh, in your mind, like, I wonder if this is the time I'm going to get caught? Probably right at Mr. Probably every time. It, yeah, yeah, probably every time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Gladys, do you think, uh, did she have a reaction when you injected her? She fought a little bit. Did she? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Like she struggled around, so I, I found a spot on her leg that I could do where she couldn't reach me and pinch me. Okay. Would that be something difficult if you were giving her medication she'd like yeah. to pinch? Pinch. Scratch. Feel up her mouth. Is that common in patients? Um, yeah. 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 Okay. And um, like even the, the PSWs who had to change her uh, product, mm -hmm. sometimes she'd fight them and scratch them and pinch them and twist their hair and yeah. Do you think that played into any part of your actions with Gladys, um, particularly with Gladys? I don't know. I think some of the, the um, I think some of it did. You know, the stubbornness and stuff, and yeah, just kind of okay. You're the next one to go. But again, there was always that red surging that I identified as God telling me, "This is one. You know, this is how you work for me." Did you ever try and fight that feeling? Later on, as you'll see. Mm -hmm. okay. But when you got that feeling in your chest and, and stomach, would you would you directly go to get the insulin? Um, pretty much. It, as soon as I had time with the rest of my job. Mm -hmm. How many patients would you be caring for during, on one shift? Thirty-two. You'd be responsible for all thirty-two. Yeah, thirty-two. So each nurse would have thirty-two. Yeah, nurse. Uh, our registered practical nurse, registered practical nurse. Okay. So that's a busy day. Mm-hmm. And I know we talked about it earlier, but again, just to revisit that, do, do you think that's something that played into this? I think the so. The stresses of the job? I, oh, yeah, I definitely think Because you had a lot going on in your life. Yeah, I definitely think the stress played into it. Maybe made, me, made my mind more susceptible to mm -hmm. stuff. Did you ever go to work? Um, Intoxicated by alcohol or drugs at all? Um, no. Did you ever use at work? Yes. Yeah. The hydromorphs? Yes. Yeah. Often? Probably once or twice a week. Yeah. Yeah. And when you were at Crescent Care, where would you get the hydromorphs from? Oh, there's a number of ways you can get them. Right. You can sign off that somebody got their, sign off that somebody won the PRN mm -hmm. and take it instead. Okay. You can uh, take them their regular medication, and if they're not able to identify it, mm -hmm. take it instead. Okay. You can take the regular medication that's in capsules, and if they are able to identify it, 
open the capsule, take the stuff out, put the capsule back together again, give them the empty the capsule, take it yourself. And how would you typically adjust the hydromorphs? I just swallowed it. I never shot it. I never snorted it. Yeah. This practice has consequences that one might not think of right away. Any disruption to someone's medication schedule has the potential for a serious impact on their health and maybe even lead to death. The number of patients that have prematurely died because of the lax way medication is tracked is probably higher than anyone is comfortable thinking about. Okay. And do you remember how much you gave Gladys? Of the insulin? Mm -hmm. I think I gave her 8060. Okay. And her reaction after after she kind of pinched and, and struggled a little bit with you? She relaxed and then um, by the time the next nurse came on she was red, she was sweating, she was incoherent. She her blood saw her vital signs were all down. And how do you know that? Because I was just leaving when the next nurse came on and she CSWs came to her and said something's going on with Gladys, and she, she said, come with me, we have to go check on Gladys. And so, yes, yeah, so I actually helped her move Gladys to the palliative care room. Okay. Scared out of my gourd the whole time <laughs> that she was going to say it was something I did. Thinking, okay. Was she still able to communicate at that point? No. Okay. Do you remember what nurse that was that you moved? Karen? Gladys? I don't remember her last name. If I sit for a minute, if I sat for a minute, I could probably remember. Well, if it comes to you, um, might just be one of those things that pops in your head in a few moments, right? Yeah. Rutledge. Karen Rutledge? Yeah. She's still there? Yep, yeah, as far as I know. So this is where you have a bit of a gap again, from yeah. 2011 to 2013 with your successful yeah. injections, but there was, and there wasn't even any attempt. No. You know, if I'm, in November 2011, I came home from a uh, cruise of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and I was feeling guilty, I was feeling damned, I was feeling confused. I I was feeling like I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was feeling like if I could somehow connect with God strongly enough that I wouldn't do it anymore. And so I spent a lot of time reading my Bible and praying and deciding I just wasn't going to do it anymore. So I had the odd urge to do it, but I resisted by going to church, reading my Bible, praying, and telling God I didn't believe him that he wanted me to do it anymore. What's your treatment to that one? Um. Where's that? Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Um. So as far as fighting off that, do, would you still have that feeling, like that burning feeling? Sometimes, but I, I did a lot of praying about it, and I would, I just did a lot of praying, reading my Bible, getting very involved in my, in my faith, getting very involved in my church. Right. Okay. And, and obviously, with what you've told us so far, that it helped, yeah. from what you've documented. Yeah. Is there anything else that we need to be aware of that happened in between those times? No. Okay. No. I didn't tell anybody or anything like that. Okay. Except for the, the pastor, sorry, what did you That do? was, I told him after Helen Young. Okay. He was after Helen Young. I'm just going to turn this off so it keeps vibrating. I apologize for that. It's okay. I may fart and I'll have to apologize for that. There we go. Um, so that was after Helen. So Helen was uh, at Crescent Care. Where was uh, where was Helen's room? She was on A side. I had been transferred to A side, which is the new unit, like well, relatively new, 10, 10, 12 years old. I was on the first floor. I was the charge nurse to the first floor, and she was 
in the room closest to the nurse's station. Okay. So where would he, was that like if I, for me going to nursing care, would it be closer to Fife or closer to North Ave? Okay, so there's the retirement home. There's the wall that joins the retirement home to the to the nursing home. There's North Point. There's South Point. There's East Point. And then down at the end of the hallway of East Point is uh, Unit 1 and Unit 2 in the building right on top of each other. And what was the purpose of that area of, of present care? Oh, it was, it was all single room. Okay. Yeah. So Helen was in her own room? Helen was in her own room, yeah. It was all single room that area. Alright. Um, and Helen was a type 2 diabetic with dementia? Yeah. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about Helen. Uh, Helen was miserable. She frequently yelled out to help me nurse. She frequently yelled out she wanted to die. She just was not happy with her life. She was real. Wheel around in a wheelchair saying, help me nurse, help me nurse, help me nurse, help me nurse. And when you went to help her, what do you want help with? Nothing. Get away with me. Go away. Help me nurse, help me nurse. Didn't want to eat, didn't want to drink. Very difficult to deal with. Um, constantly would yell out. And, or we'd say, what do you want help with? I want to die. Why can't you help me die? I want to die. And one night, it was like something snapped inside. It is hard to tell which was the trigger. It could have been the stress of dealing with a difficult patient, or the fact that the patient claimed to want to die may have been too tempting for wet Lawford to resist. And that red surge came back and I thought, okay, you will die. So uh, I gave her a shot, I came up to her and said, this is for your pain, and I gave her a shot of long acting or short acting, and she started to settle down. And then um, later on we put her into bed and I gave her more off, more of the uh, insulin, I think it was long acting. She had a seizure. She turned red. She um, was diaphoretic. The PSWs called me to the bedside. Um, I took all of her vital signs and I pretended to take a blood sugar. Because I said, oh, it's normal. Don't worry about it. How did you cope with that with people beside you? Their PSWs. <laughs> Don't, no, don't let anybody no see that part of the... PSWs? No, but what I mean is, what I mean by that is PSWs, nurses sub, nurses focus on the meds right. and treatment. Okay. PSWs focus on, like, they were busy. They were busy washing her. They were busy changing her. They were busy dealing with the fact that she was having diarrhea. They were not doing the part of the job I was doing. Right. So they never would have noticed. Where's my burger? So they never would have noticed um, me not taking the blood sugar. Because I took her, like I did her pulse, I did everything right. else, so they wouldn't have noticed that I didn't do that because they were busy with everything else. Okay. Okay. And, you just, and I just said, oh, blood sugar's good, 5.6, she's good. Which is a, a number that in your mind you knew was average and nothing concerning the 5.6 yeah. or whatever you said. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you remember what shift you were working at this point? Afternoons. I was straight through to 11, but at that point I was straight through to 11 on, on that ward. Okay. That it started a little bit before that. Yeah. Okay. And that would have been an individual room, as you said? Yes. Okay. And do you remember when um, Mrs. Young died? Uh, one to two days afterwards. Okay. Do, you, do you know if you were present for that? No, it wasn't. Was there a different procedure at all when people passed away in that in that wing opposed to where you were prior to? No, it was all the same nursing home. It was all the same policies. Okay. It was just that that nursing home was that wing of the nursing home was built to accommodate the fact that um, the owner took over Narvilla okay. in Norwich. Okay. So everybody from Narvilla got moved to the new part of the nursing home. So that's the other reason. And then eventually they all got mixed together. Right. Okay. So being that it had been a few years then, um, when you injected uh, 
Mrs. Young and you were successful in, in causing her death. How did it make you feel after those few years that these urges and these feelings had come back? I felt horrible. I felt angry at myself. I felt like I had failed myself. I felt like God had failed me. Did you continue to practice in the church? I continued going to church, yes. Yeah. Did you believe in it as much as you um, I did, but I was getting very confused. So it was soon after that that I went to the pastor and told him what had happened. And uh, he prayed over me, and because he said that was the last thing he would have thought of of me. And his wife was there too, and they prayed over me. And they said to me, now this is God's grace, but if, if you ever do this again, we will have to turn you into the police. The pastor, just like the lawyer she previously mentioned, failed in their obligation to step up. Regardless of any protections made by the law when it comes to confessions, there is a moral and ethical imperative to come forward to prevent any further loss of life. Not only did they fail the victims, but they failed Wetlawfer by enabling her to continue killing people, for which in spite of everything else, she does feel a sense of guilt. And where would these come where would that conversation have taken place? The in, no, in their house at their kitchen table. And I kept going to their church. And did, how detailed would you with the conversation? Oh, I had told I told him that I was taking people's lives by giving them in some of the addresses. What were you specifically names? How much information no. you were doing this? No. How many people? I don't know if I told him how many people did, but I was doing it. I wanted to stop. Okay. And his response was to pray for you and pray over you. He could put his hands on me and have to put his hands on me and pray. What uh, what religion did that church practice? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, did Helen have any family that you recall that would come yes, visit her? Yes, she had a niece that loved her very much and was there at least twice a week. Did you ever converse with her? Before before she died, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How old was she? I'm saying in the late 50s, early 60s. The niece? The niece, yes. Yeah. And how long or something? 90. Right. Did you speak to her following how long said her niece? What? Okay, what was that? I think it was a day or two after when she was gathering her stuff and she cried on my shoulder and thanked me for being a good nurse. And again, the feelings that you had at that point? Oh, guilt, shame, anger. Like I had betrayed her. And not that I was betrayed, but betrayal. Mm -hmm. But I betrayed her. And did you display any emotion at that point to her? Um, I just, you know, gave her hug back and said I was so sorry. But on that point in time, I was getting very confused about was this God and was it not. And when you resumed doing this, did you have any, besides the religious feelings that you were having, did you have any other uh, personal um, feelings in your mind as, as far as knowing the difference between right and wrong again? Yes, yes, I knew the difference between right and wrong. But I thought this was something that God or whoever wanted me to do it. So I was starting at that point to, to doubt that it was God. Okay. When you resume doing it? Yeah. Was anyone working with you on that day that you can recall? Um, the PSWs, but I don't remember their names. Okay. How and many would have there been? Three. Okay. There would have been students, too, I think. But I can't remember. And there would have been 32 patients in that wing as well? Yes. That you're responsible for? Okay. Um, March of 2014, this is Marine Victor Ant Crossing Care. Yeah. Tell me about Marine. Mm. Marine was a handful. Um, she would attack other patients, she would pull their hair, she would hit them, she would pinch them. Eventually, um, it was decided that she needed a one on one staff. So sometimes they would book an extra PSW to be with her. Sometimes someone will come from the outside to be with her. 
But when one more wasn't available, it was the role of the church nurse. And that was nuts. Sorry. That's just absolutely nuts. So, um, she just got harder and harder to look after. And one night when I had had to look after her, I got this idea. I thought, you know, I'm starting to get the feeling of that surge again. I thought, no, I don't want her to die. But if I could somehow give her enough of a dose to give her a coma or something to change her brain waves, maybe make her less, you know, maybe make her less mobile, hard to handle, less handle, hard to handle. So, uh, yeah. If I was a doctor. And was that in the same wing? Yes, she was right across. She had gone into the room that um, Helen had been in. Okay. Yeah, she was right across from the nurse's station. And as well, obviously, a single room at that point? Yeah, that um, night she stroked. She had a severe stroke. She went to the hospital. And when she came back, she was there for a few there at the nursing home for a few days, and she died. But before she came back from the hospital, I was fired from Crescent Care for medication errors that had nothing to do with this. When you when when you got transferred into this A wing, did you still get the medication the same way? The insulin the same way? Yeah, because there's been some purchase there. Okay. okay. And so sorry, Marine, uh, Mrs. Pickering was transferred from Crest Care to the hospital. And then and back, back to Crest Care. Yeah. How what was the time frame there, do you remember? Two days, I think. And but they knew that she was totally vegetative when she came back. Okay. So she was basically she was coming back to, to pass away yeah. at Crest Care. Yeah. Was she put in palliative care when she returned? No, because she had her own room. Okay. The palliative care room was for people who didn't have their own room. Right. So that families could go and be with them. Okay. And not, you know, not disturb the other residents and not be disturbed by the other residents. Right. Do you remember how much insulin did you give to Mrs. Pickering? It was a lot. It was a lot. Um, I'm going to say 80 long acting and 50 short acting, something like that. That was a lot of insulin. Why so much to her? Wasn't sure if she would die or not. And I really wanted to make sure that she, uh, their mind would change a bit before she came after. So the insulin caused her uh, a stroke. A stroke, and then, and then the, the reason to travel to the hospital. Yes. Um, do you remember any reaction from her when you were injecting her? No, none at all. Do you remember what type of level, sorry, apologize, what part of the body that you injected her? Her arm. Left, right. Um, left. Left up. And no reaction to Um, oh yeah, the first time I gave it to her, she said, hey, what was that for? And I said, that's your, that's your vitamin injection. Which is, like you said, that you would typically tell people? Yeah. Okay. How long in between when you gave her the next dose? Probably an hour and a half, two hours. Again, Wet Lawfer injects them and uses the exact same excuse that it is a vitamin shot. It wasn't as risky as it sounds since most of the time patients in that state are unaware of exactly what medication they are on or when they are supposed to be taking it. Oh, I don't know. You were still eight. working in the afternoon, right? Yeah, 8 or 9 at night. Okay. Okay, yeah, so I shared that at 8 o'clock. You gave her a few units for Yeah. Did uh, Ms. Pickering give you a call on your family that she had? She had two friends that came and saw her a lot. And she had a boyfriend that would come to see her. Okay. How old was she? 82. How old was her boyfriend? Oh, I have no idea. No? No. But he would call her to a visit. He would come to visit, yeah. yeah. Was there any restrictions on visiting practices at all, certain hours? Um, basically, no. If they wanted to come late at night, they had to let us know. Okay. So we could let them in and out. Okay. Some, and that was more for pious people. Right. But no, there was no real restrictions. I mean, there was the odd patient who had a restriction, like 
they can't leave the building with this person, or they can't leave the building with that person, or so-and-so shows up, call the police, that sort of thing. Do you, do you remember if you were present when she passed away? I was not. I'd already been fired. Okay, so sorry, between the time that she... When were you fired? Um, late March, early April. Was it when she was at the hospital? Or did she come back and then... She had come back and then I was fired. And then she but lived for a few more days. Yeah. You were fired in the meantime. Yeah, and she passed. for something that had nothing to do with her. And my timeline may be wrong. Mm -hmm. It may have been February. Mm -hmm. Because I know that... I know by the middle of April I was working again at um, Meadow Partners in home. Yeah. What was the, the cause of your your firing one? Sorry, there was a medication or something. I had had a few medication errors, and strangely enough, not on purpose, one of our residents was missing her long-acting insulin that she got at supper, okay. and it was coming from pharmacy, but I wanted to make sure she got her insulin, mm -hmm. so I took insulin from another person who I thought was the same insulin, but it was short-acting. Mm -hmm. And it gave her a seizure because she wasn't used to it, and she was she was okay. We we helped her, and she was all right. But when they figured it out, I was fired because I had had other medication errors as well. Mm -hmm. No, no, different thing. I drop. Ah, uh, a lot of different stuff. And what do you think that was a result of? What med med error? Mm -hmm. The workload. Yeah. Was it anything to do with were you still using it at this point? Um, you know what? I never made a I never made a work trip. I never made a med error when I was using it at work. Never. Just had your focus. Yeah. Did you ever commit any of these death in your reason? No. Not no. So no med errors, no deaths. When I was using it. Your using was all the feeling in your chest and your stomach. And yeah, the searching and the, yeah, and then the laughter afterwards, which was really, it was like a cackling from the pit of hell, if that makes sense. Did the cackling continue um, when Mrs. Young was injected with insulin? Um, after, after that two-year break? Yes, yeah. yes, it did. It, same, same, same cackling. Same cackling. Same feeling, same cackling. So then you, did you work anywhere between Crescent Care and Meadow Park? No. Okay, did you go directly from one to the other? Pretty much, within a month. And and would those medication errors be documented in a reference letter or? No. To, were you made aware of anything like that that Meadow Park uh, would be aware of the reason why you were? Um, I told the years? person that hired me at Meadow Park, she told me she had found my resume somewhere because okay. I never applied to Meadow Park. Oh, really? But she found my resume somewhere, and she called me because they needed a nurse. Oh, okay. So when we did our interview, her name was Heather, I forget your last name. She's not there anymore. Um, when we did our interview, she said to me, why did you leave? And I told her, I said, I'll be absolutely honest with you. I was fired from Medairs. And she said, well, tell me about them, and I did. And she said, okay, well, I believe in second chances, so you're hired. After admitting to the medication errors, Wetlaufer should not have been hired, but her story seems to be a constant string of poor judgment and improper protocols that allowed her to commit this string of murders. Full-time afternoons, and it was a one-year contract. Okay. And how, how long were you unemployed for then? A month. Just a month? Yeah. Okay. And would you commute back and forth and you still live in Woodstock at the time? I still live in Woodstock and I commute back and forth. First three afternoons? Yeah. What was that? What were the hours for the street afternoon? Uh, either 6.30, no, sorry, either 2.30 to 10.30 or 3 to 11. Okay. I'm not sure which it was. So when you got to Meadow Park, what was the difference as far as the workflow of the patients that you were responsible for? Were no difference. <laughs> it was extremely similar. The only difference was that the um, RPNs would do the, um, if there were dressings that had to be done at night. Mm -hmm. 
they do the dressings on the people at night that were my people. Okay. But other, other than that, Same. yeah. Okay. And um, your supervisor, supervisor at that point at Hunter Park, was that the same person that hired you, Heather? Or? Yeah. Okay. She was the nursing supervisor. Okay. So she'd be her direct supervisor. Yeah. Um, so, Arpad, or Arporvap? Yes. Tell me a little bit about her. Um, he was mean. He would grab the nurses and these NCSWs whenever they were trying to do things for him. He would grab them, he would twist their arms, he would punch them. Very difficult to do uh, care for. And uh, one night I just got that surgery and I thought that you need to go. Had he done something that night? No, not really, just been his normal self. And he fought, he fought the first needle. And then um, the second needle I got in. And I forgot something about Maureen. Mm -hmm. I had given her um, a dose of whatever we dosed her with to calm her down before I ever gave her the insulin. forgot about that. So I had done that. So Is that in there? About Maureen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'd given her a sedative dose before I ever gave her the insulin. Oh, you said you gave her how little? Yeah. yeah. You and you recall doing that? Yes, I did. And then the two insulin injections? Yeah. And did it calm? Did the how calm calm her? Do you remember? No, no, it didn't. So, Art, I gave. A large amount of short acting, a large amount of long acting in between each other. And then I, when I left for the night, he was still okay. When I came back the next day and worked, they said that he had had a stroke, severe stroke, and gone to the hospital. And the nurse that I talked to who'd been on the night before, she said, you know how low his blood sugar was? And I said, how low? And she said, oh, like one point something. And then, and then she said, but you know what? I went home and I did some research, research mm -hmm. and sometimes having a bad stroke can make your blood sugar go low. Really? Yeah, that's what she said to me. That was so, odd, too? Yeah, that was odd. But, yeah, so he lived for a couple of days and then he passed. Do you remember what nurse that was? The um, it was the night nurse. A um, little short little team of lady. That's what I remember. Okay. Okay. Um, and do you remember what time of the night that you had injected her? Um, I'm going to say 7.30 and then 9.30. Okay. And um, his reaction to it? He fought it. Did he? Yeah, but he fought everything. Would you ever, when you were doing this, were you ever, did you ever speak to these people when you were injecting them? No. Would you ever say anything to them? Not unless they asked me what I was doing, then I'd just say it was a right the injection. But having that, and, and it's documented in here a few times, having that feeling of anger and, and frustration, would you ever... No. You would never state anything to vocalize your, your anger towards that person as you were injecting them? No. no. And Art then, um, where did you inject him? His arm and his thigh. Okay. And what were you telling him at that point that you were giving him? Did he ask? Um, it's just coming up, but then I need to have your medicine. And eventually I put it in there. And was there an immediate reaction to him at all? Did he, did he stroke right away? No, he didn't stroke till I left. Okay. And then that's when you came in the next day and had the conversation with that yeah. Filipino nurse? Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry, I don't remember your name. That's okay. Um, the four or five days later when he passed away, do you remember if that was back at Meadow Park or was it in the hospital? Yeah, it was in the hospital. Oh, so he never been, came back. It may have just been two or three days. It seemed like it was four or five. Mm -hmm. And his family was devastated. Absolutely devastated. What was his uh, health like at that point? Prior it, to other than, other than dementia, he was fairly strong. He was in a wheelchair, but he was a good eater and he was strong. And How old was he? I'm going to say maybe 78.
As Wetlaufer recounts each murder, one would think that she was talking about an average routine day as if they weren't actually paying attention to the details. She speaks very matter-of-factly and sometimes even laughs about things that occurred. With this attitude, it's surprising that she bothered to confess at all. And who was his family members? He had a son named Art who uh, did um, stand-up comedy. Oh, no okay. Yeah, but I, I think it was just like open mic night. Right. And then his his wife. Okay. That's it. That's all I remember. I know he had other, but that's the Do you remember if there were other son or daughters or just other family members that you could look There were other family members involved, but I don't recall. Okay. Um... Did you ever have any interaction with his family? I mean, you said they were devastated. What did you learn of that? How did you Well, they that? came in to take stuff out of his room. Following his death? Well, he was still in the hospital. They okay. came in to take some stuff, and then when he was gone, they came in to take the rest. Okay. How did you feel having a conversation with him? Awful. Um, again, like I betrayed him. How are you feeling right now? Can I go to the bathroom again? Yeah. Yeah. I know we're almost done. We are. I've got the 710. Okay. We're getting there. The saddest parts of this confession is the fact that Wetlaufer seems to respond to therapy, and if she had sought help sooner, many or maybe even all of those deaths could have been prevented. It really helped me to clarify that. And the original of this document? Is in my knapsack in the back of your car. And we'll get, we'll, we'll get down the road at that point, but it's is providing us with the original document something you'd be willing to do? Yes. 
and we'll get to that. Um, Do you have a stamp that you can stamp it as the original? Um, I don't even think we'll need to do that. We'll have you sign okay. that, that consent form, and we'll, we'll oh, get to that. Okay. Um, if, only if you're willing, of course. Um, you have a portion on the fourth page here and it's titled People Who Didn't Die. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about? Okay, Clotilde Ayodurano. Okay. She was the first person I ever gave extra insulin to. Okay. I think I gave her 40 and it, I just, again, there was that searching, but it wasn't so much that I wanted her to die, it was more that see what happened. And I did, I did that to her on more than one occasion. Okay. Uh, Albino I'm was... I'm sorry, she was prior to Mr. Silcox, right? Yes. Yeah. So this was the very first person you yeah. injected with insulin? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we're at Crescent Care? At Crescent Care. And her room was where? Her room was in the East Wing, second door on the left. Okay. And then East Wing, first door on the left was your sister Albina. She was diabetic. Okay. Um, she was October 2007. Sorry, that was her sister? Matilda and Albina were sisters, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, then there was Wayne. He was on the North Wing. He was he had dementia. He was diabetic. Um, he could be uncooperative. And uh, I gave him a large overdose um, because I thought it was his turn to go. That was Wayne. That was Wayne. And mm -hmm. sorry, how old was? Sorry, and I hate to go back. I just have a few more questions. How old was Catilda? Catilda was 90 or so. And her sister? Alvina was probably 80, 82. And did they have family that would come and visit? Yes. Yes. Alright. Very much so. Who would that be that would come to visit? Matilda, I think it was her daughters, and Alvina was her husband. Okay. And long acting, short acting? Short acting at that point. In 07, you were still doing short acting. Okay. And do you remember the dose that oh, they would have Wait a second. What would they get at night? It was long acting, so it was what they got at night with those two. It was their own insulin just extra dose. So. In the beginning, possibly without even realizing it, Wetlaufer was making test runs to see if she would actually be able to kill someone. At that time, it would still be possible to make it seem like there had been some sort of mix-up if she had been caught in the act or taking the medication, but each success only emboldened her. Probably age 20, 30 to 40. 30 to 40. Extra. Okay. And then Wayne, how old was Wayne, sorry? I'd say 60. Okay, oh, so he was younger. He, yeah, he had developmentally, developmental challenges, as well as dementia, as well as being diabetic, um, as well as being handful. Um, and uh, he wanted to die. So, again, that one night I just felt that surging and but he didn't die. I think How would you know he wanted to die? He would say it sometimes. That he just wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Where was Wayne in the present care? He was in room 8, which is the men's ward down at the end. So 8 or A? 8. The eight. number? 8 north. 8 north. Alright, and would that be a roommate in there as well? Yes. Do you know who he was roomed with? Uh, no. No. And Mike with Huntington's disease? That was 2009. What, what is that disease? It robs you of your body and you still have your mind. You get progressively more agitated, you get progressively more um, psychotic, and you're in a wheelchair and you've got all these movements that you can't control. It's a horrible disease. And how old was Mike? He was 54. And uh, again, one night I just felt that searching and I thought, now this must be God because this man is not enjoying his life at all. So I gave him a large amount of insulin. I think I gave him 90 total. Did he ever do anything to harm you? No, never. Did Wayne? No. Albina? No. Cotilla? No. Um, this takes us to a different location in Telford Place in Paris. That's obviously Paris, Ontario, correct? Yeah. Outside of, uh, kind of Brantford, Woodstock area? 2016 winter. Okay, and that was Sandra? Yeah. How and old I was, was Sandra? Sandra, I think she was in her 70s. Okay. And Telford 
place? What what was the breakup of the rooms there? Where was she located? Um, she place? was she was down the wing, straight down from the um, nurses' desk, about two doors on the left. Okay. And she had three roommates. Okay. And she described her a little bit of personality in her. Uh, um, tall. Um, not very well. She didn't walk anymore. She had a good sense of humor. Um, she often said she didn't want to be there. And so one night I gave her an instant overdose. But she survived because the nurse that came on next um, went to check on her to do something else and noticed that she was sweaty and took her blood sugar and saved her life. Mm. Okay. And how did these other people survive? Um, it just didn't, oh, Clotilda and Albina, mm -hmm. they found them to have short blood, sh they found them to have low blood sugar, and they gave them stuff to raise it. And Wayne and Mike, they just survived. It was never found out. Was there anything to do with the gender, male or female, that this influenced the effect of it, or was it just, again, not just dependent on the makeup yeah. of their body and their health? And yeah, not that I know if it has anything to do with gender. Um, the nurse who saved Sandra. Yeah. Was there anything that ever came back on you? No. Any retribution consequences? No. She never figured it out that I know of. She even asked me about it and asked if I thought she'd done the right thing. Who was that? Do you remember her name? Diane. I don't remember her last name. And what, what were you working at that point? What's just where you working at Telford Place? Whatever I got called in for. I was actually working for a nursing agency at that time called Lifeguard Agency, mm -hmm. and I was sent to Telford as a lifeguard. I see. So you were never employed by Telford Place? No. no. I was employed by Lifeguard, and I would go to Telford and to other places as well. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's when you got involved with St. Elizabeth as well, right? You were with her? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just I was only with St. Elizabeth like a month and a half before it quit. Okay. Okay. 2016 of August, which is not too long ago, um, you're employed with St. Elizabeth, it says here. Yeah, I was frustrated with my job. I had a huge, um, huge workload, having to learn a lot of new things, just a lot of frustration. Um, the weekend that this happened, there I had all all of the people that I had to look after, most of them were in Ingersoll. I didn't know any of them. And uh, on the Saturday I went in and I was doing my care. And uh, this is really the only one that was pre-planned because on Saturday I went in and I was doing care on Beverly. I noticed that she had a pick line, which is one to take medication straight to your heart. Mm -hmm. And that she was a diabetic. And so the next day when I went in I was really frustrated and I could just really feel the surging and the laughing, and I I gave her a huge amount. I gave her, I think it was 180, three, three doses of 60 okay. through the pick line. Did she question that at all? No, because I used one to rinse the pick line, one to put into her eyes, and one to rinse the pick line again. The closest we can come to finding a common factor would be stress. Whether in her private life or in the workplace, once wet lawfer hits a certain point, she gets one of her surges. And uh, she survived. She was fine the next day. Did you go see that again? No, but I was able to check it on my computer because she was seen every day by a nurse. Okay. So I could go into the tablet from work and see how she was. Okay. And that was just a computer program used by St. Elizabeth? Yes. I see. Okay. On their own tablet. Okay. And these other people, where did you inject them? Uh, their arms. All of them? All of them, yes. Yeah. Sandy was probably her leg, but she was a little bit more difficult. In August of, of 2016, then, with Beverly, you don't remember Beverly's last name? No, I don't. Okay. I don't even remember if her first name was Beverly. Oh, okay. I could probably, oh, I don't know if I could tell you the weekend it was or not. But she lived in Ingersoll? Yes. Did she live in a home, or? Uh, yeah, in a home. Like, like a her home. own residence, I mean, or?
you remember where in your solar was? No, I don't. No. Okay. Um, how can you have a name Beverly, but you're not sure what her name is? Because I'm not sure if it was Bev or B or... I gotcha. Okay. Okay. And that was the only one you had given through a thick line? Yes. Did you know what the result would be compared to a direct injection into an arm or a leg or a thigh? I'd never done it line? before. I never looked at it. I had no idea. She went she went to sleep fairly quickly and I left. But when I checked uh the next day to see how she was for the next nurse, there was no change. How old was she? She was sixty three, sixty four. And what was her diagnosis as far as her health? She was diabetic and she had large ulcers on her leg. And she also had a um, severe infection. How does that make you feel going through all that? Awful. Do you feel like there's a burden on your shoulders? Yes, I've done the right thing. Do you feel there's a sense of relief? Yes, and now I know that it wasn't God, and I'm ashamed of myself that that happened, but I also think that it was mental health. You know, I think it was, I was in my right mind. Or I would have been able to tell them. And who, I was raised to believe in God. I was raised from a baby to go to Sunday school. So how could I get such a strong feeling that this is what God wanted, unless it was something wrong with my head? I don't know, we've talked about it what you would say to the families and, and so on and so forth, but um, again, I, I, I feel terrible for the for the people that are going to find out in the days and, and weeks to come about what actually happened to their loved ones, right? I do. Um, I feel horrible. Um, if there was ever anything I could do so that nobody did this again, I'd do it. Just a few other things to cover off then. Okay. Um, the things that some of these people would do to you, the hitting, the pinching, the grabbing of your breasts, would you ever report that? Yeah. Well, yeah, it was always reported in the charge as well. And that's just documented on their charts? Yeah. Okay. And was there any, there's obviously never, not obviously, but was there ever any charges or criminal matters that came up any of this no, at all? Oh, no. That's part of working in the nursing home. That's just what they do. Might even be your fault, dear. Yeah, I said that. Mrs. Yeah. Do you think that might have played a role in, in your actions? No. Um, Maureen, your ex. What was Maureen last night? Think about what four years ago when she wanted money to move back. Oh. We were only together for a year. Okay. So she came here from. Yeah, and brought her two kids. Okay. The teenage kids. Yeah. I think you mentioned here at the season. Yeah, we got involved with them. We'll see you guess with them. Mm-hmm. When they were here. Mhm. Uh-huh. Have you, this document that you prepared, Beth, and I know that you had stated the reason why, I guess you call it the breaking point of why you stopped, yeah. was the possibility that you were going to have to be dealing with kids. Yes, that's right. Wetlawfer was unable to deal with children. This may have been because she would find it harder to justify killing them than she did the elderly. With them, she was able to tell herself that their life was almost over anyway, or they were in pain so it didn't really matter. With a child, that would have been a harder lie to sell herself. Right? Yeah. Is there anyone else within your career path that isn't listed on these four documents, or these four pieces of paper, that you'd be responsible for their deaths? No, absolutely not. And if we were to tell you that We've come across some fairly significant or suspicious uh, 
deaths at other nursing homes? Where I've been? Right. What would you say to that? I'd say it wasn't me. So there's no one else involved? No. Um, that was fell victim to your actions? No. Um, just, just repeat to me again the people that you've disclosed this to besides myself tonight. Okay. Um, the very first person I ever disclosed it to was um, another girlfriend at the time. Her name was. That was after I killed a couple of people, and uh, she told me not to do it again, or she was going to turn me into the police. Um, that, oh, I couldn't tell you, 2008, I think. Um, and then uh, 2011, when I decided to stop killing, my friend, I told her what I'd been doing and that I had stopped. And then um, I told my pastor. And then after that, I told the, in 2014, um, after I passed away, I uh, went on a holiday, and uh, that's when I really decided that this had to stop. And so um, I told um, a friend who lives in BC. Um, then uh, I told when I came back, I got a advice from a lawyer. And then while I was in the Toronto, it was in CAMH. Well, I told my friend, before everyone, I've told my cousin, I told my friend, and I told my friend, and then while I was in CAMH, I told um, someone who I thought was a friend. They turned around and called the police to make sure that it had really been dealt with. And I understand that he thought he was doing the right thing. I understand that, but he had said, oh, I won't tell anybody, and... I was using him as a resource for support, and he turned around. Right. When I was, when I had already, you know, I'd already shared it. So why would he call the police? So why do you think that none of these people confronted police? Maybe they didn't believe me. I don't know. Maybe they just thought. Maybe they thought I was doing more something that the patient wanted done. You know. And as far as believing you, are these close people to you that you've shared other? Deep dark secrets of maybe over time. But I I would say deep dark secrets and lots of stuff. Yeah. Because this is a pretty serious thing. Yes, it is. It's right. horrible. I'm telling you. It's the worst thing. Telling these people, I just find it hard to believe that no one would come forward until just five, six people down the road, right? Yeah. Of, of having knowledge of it. Yeah, I hear you. It's frightening that out of all the people Wetlover told, only one actually went to the police to make sure she had confessed herself. But crime against the elderly is often minimized, so it's more sad than surprising. Yeah. And everything that you're telling us is the truth? Yes, it is. There's yes, nothing that's been fabricated? No, sir. No. And you're sure about that? I know so. What would we find in your home? Did you ever document any of this activity um, at all? Once in a while, I, don't, I journaled on it. There, it might, there might be some in my home, but I don't know. Where would I those think be? I threw it out. In my, if, if it's around, it would be in like a spiral binder in um, either my desk, my other desk, or my, uh, full, my um, whatchamacallit. Come on. File, file folders in there. Yes, yeah, file cabinet. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. And that's. Did you live uh, alone? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes. Did you want someone to come with me alone? Well, to be honest with you, as part of the investigation, there's already been a search warrant executed at your house. Oh, so the search is already. There's already been a search warrant. I don't know what stage it's at because we've been conversing for quite some time. Okay. It's probably close to being completed. Okay. But I'm just asking. Because you've been so cooperative, yeah. and, and again, I do appreciate that. Yeah. I really do. Um, it just makes things a lot easier, right? Um, advising us where certain things might be, and you said you might have thrown them out. Yeah. You might not have. I might not have kept them. And then at the very end of my coffee table, there's a box, 
it's got pictures and a photo album in it. There might be something in there too. Oh, yeah. A a Charlie Q um writing writing pad. What types of things? What types of things would you document? Just what I had done, how bad I felt, when it happened. Just trying to figure out what was going on in my head. Mm -hmm. yeah. Searching for answers. Yeah. But you're not sure if you have rid of those or not yet. I thought I got rid of them all, but I don't know if I did for sure. Okay. And would there be anything else as far as computer documents and anything like that? Um, there would be. I access the uh, computer support group for borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. It would be on that. It would be on that website. Oh, it's just an open forum that you could join and, yes. and post comments. And yeah. What website was that? I couldn't tell you, but I could find it on my computer. Okay. And would that be something that you'd be willing to share with us? Of course. You give us a good time to yep. look at those documents and computer websites and whatnot. Yeah. What's your tattoo mean? Hopes and dreams. Does that mean that? That I have hopes for the future and dreams of the future. Yeah. What are your hopes of the future now? After speaking over the last few hours? That somehow, some way I can help somebody. There's got to be somebody with, wherever I go to jail, penitentiary. There's got to be somebody I can help. Maybe somebody who can't read. Maybe somebody who can't write. Maybe somebody who's done worse than me and feels like it will never be forgiven. Maybe somebody who's done less than me feels like it will never be forgiven. There's got to be something that can come from this. Maybe somebody can study me and come up with answers and new medications so this doesn't happen again. That's my hopes and dreams now. Whitlaufer seems very earnest in her desire to help others even if she ends up in prison. Given how honest she has been, there is no reason to doubt her. It's hard to reconcile this aspect of her with the part of her that is able to so easily take the life of another person. Is there anything worse than taking someone else's life? Uh, yes. Child molestation. Child molestation. Absolutely. Did you feel that you might harm the children and yourself if you were to work with them? I was afraid that, that I might get that feeling of wanting to give them insulin or doses, especially since they were di diabetic, and I just, I panicked, and there was no way. I was absolutely not open to that. Is there anyone else that you can think of right now? No. No? I think I did pretty good. I think you did. So what happens gonna, now? I'm just going to get you to sit tight. Uh, and we'll arrange to, to uh, see what the next steps are. Oh, okay. I might not be going home then. I will get back to you with that. Okay. Um, we discussed your um, original document that's in your backpack. Yeah. If I were to prepare a form, which is a consent to search or a consent form, to provide us with those documents, would that be something that you'd be willing to sign? Yeah, sure. Okay. There's some stuff in there too that I did with the nurse. In your backpack? Yeah. Okay. What kind of things are those? Like it's called a chain link thing, so you start at what you did and you go backwards to how you're feeling, what you could have done different, and all that. Okay. Do you feel that your time at can be trusted? Yes, very yeah. much so. You received the care that you thought you needed. Yeah, and, that's, and an increase in medication, which I feel I needed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. Sit tight for a few moments, okay. and I'll uh, be back to see shortly, okay? Again, on my uh, phone, I've got 7.39 okay. p.m. And uh, let me get back to it, uh, some answers, and okay. where we're going from here, okay? I'd like to go home. Okay. We'll sit tight, and we'll, we'll see what's going on. Yeah, I have to wear an ankle bracelet. I'd like to go home. Okay. All right. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Can someone cut these off with me now? Yeah, we'll get something to get those off. Okay, right. thank you. Yeah, I'll be right back. Thanks. I'm sorry, Beth. That's okay. You could imagine that uh, things of this nature take some time. Yeah, and I, I understand. And I appreciate your patience with me. I understand. Thank you. So, I have 802. 
I just have to, we're in the home stretch here. Okay. Okay, and I can explain to you everything that's going to go on. Okay. 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 Fair enough. Okay. 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 So, um, first off, a few things that, and uh, you remember the gentleman who transported us back from Toronto and uh, also Karen, her, yeah. my partners, that they've just been monitoring and right. making some right. notes and things like that. They're just some things that are, are concerning and that we just need to firm up, okay? Okay. So, first off, as I said, there, there has been a search for an two bedroom residence. Okay. And there was some paperwork uh, with regards to a Remington gun shotgun of some sort. Oh. But what would that be for? Just to look at it. I like, I like guns. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do you have any in the home? No. No. I used to. Did you? What did I, you have? I had a uh, twenty-two. Yeah. Was that um, a Remington by chance? Not that I know of. Okay. But um, my my husband had a gun that his dad gave me okay. that we would shoot with, so I could stay at the at the um, so I could stay at the at the uh, gun club and shoot. Mm -hmm. And when we um, broke up, I did the paperwork to give it back to him. That might be okay. what they found. Okay. Right. Well, I don't have a gun. There's no firearms in your house right now. No, sir. Okay. No, never will be. Okay. All right. Um, the username, like what would your username be on that blog that you would uh, write on the uh, court group? I, you know what? I'd have to go and look. Yeah? Honestly. It's not like your name and a couple numbers or no. nickname or anything like that? No, I'd have to be sitting down in front of the computer to remember it. Okay. And even to find the support group. Okay. Um, these are a bunch of random questions. It's all thrown together here. Um, the insulin they used, the short acting, the long acting, was there an actual brand or a, a make of the insulin that you um, used? Might have been Novulin. Okay. Might have been Lenovo. Um, can't remember the other one. Okay. Um, when you worked with Lifeguard. Yeah. Um, I know that you had mentioned they'd send you to certain locations in certain homes. Yeah. What What were those? There was tougher places, and there was two mm -hmm. others. One of them oh, worked over. There was more than. There was Telford Place. Yeah. Um, that was the very first. Then there was, um, oh, here, I'll spend the one here. Telford Place. Detective Hergott is covering all of his bases. Even though there is no reason to believe Wetlaufer is hiding any other victims, they will still have to contact each place she has worked and conduct an investigation into any deaths that occurred during the time period she had access to the patient. They will also have to investigate the deaths that she says she is responsible for, just in case she is making a false confession. For Dover, Dover Quest, mm -hmm. what it was called. Mm -hmm. um, I did uh, one PSW shift at a place in New Hamburg, mm -hmm. but I couldn't tell you the name of it. Mm -hmm. um, also, I worked at um, uh, Tougher Place and Dover Clef are both owned by the same people and they have another nursing home in Grantford. Um, but I can't remember the name of it. Okay, and, then, okay. and then Park Lane Terrace in, Stra in uh, Paris and Hardy Terrace, I think just outside of Paris. Oh, and um, what was the other one called? Um, oh, Lord. It's way far out of town. It's like an hour and a half drive from here. My dad grew up in that area. Um, like it's in the Jarvis area, Jarvis Simcoe area. It's called. I didn't tell you. I'm sorry. My brain's shot for the night. That's okay. That's all right. Yeah. Is my house going to be a mess when I get back? No. Oh, I don't okay. think so. No, no, no. Okay. Not, not that kind of a. It's not like you see on TV. And yeah. There's bombs flying everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, your Facebook page, at one point there was a comment, or I don't know where it is in your timeline, about a pediatric nurse. Did you ever work as a pediatric nurse? Uh, 
Oh, then I was going to be working with the kids. That's what that referred to within yourself? Yes. Okay, okay, gotcha. All right. All right. Um, and just go back through the names of the people here. So we've got that you've divulged to, right? Yeah. That's your cousin? That's my cousin. Okay. I'm not doing her last name. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the lawyer, whose name I cannot remember. That's right. Is it female? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. Who's that? She was a friend from the nursing home. What one? From um from um 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 Christmas care. I told her after I stopped the first time. Everyone Wetlawfer has confessed to will have to be questioned, which will corroborate her story, confirm a timeline, and determine if any of them will be charged as well, potentially as an accessory or for withholding evidence. And she stopped being my friend because of it. Where does she work? She doesn't. She's on ODST. Did she work at a nursing home here? No. Never. Just a room? Yeah. You know where she lives in town? She lives in Toronto. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to wrap things up, but here's what's, here's what's going to happen. Okay. Okay. And part of this is going to be up to you. Um, what are your plans going forward from here? Going Where forward from here? I want to go home. Okay. I want to have a good night's sleep. Okay. I want to spend uh, Thanksgiving weekend with my family. Okay. And I want to be available to the police at any time they need me. Okay. And if I have to come back for trial, I have to come back for trial. Okay. I have no plans of leaving. Um, I can turn to my car if you want me to. Okay. Are your parents... Are you close with your parents? Like, what kind very of relationship close. do you have with them? Very, very close. I have to tell them tonight what's happened. With mom and dad. Yes, they know that. Um, they know that I've been in. They know that I've been in the hospital, but they, I just told them it was for treatment. But okay. yeah, my plan tonight is to go and talk to them one on one, like face to face, and tell them. What, what do you think their reaction is going to be? They're going to be devastated. What do you? I'm going to. I'm going to plan on staying, staying the night there. So they have access to me. Okay. What type of support do you think you're going to get from there? Eventually, all the support I need. Okay. I also plan to go to my AA groups. I had planned on doing 90 meetings in 90 days. And uh, just keep up with, like I plan to... Uh, see, one of the things that happens with me is I isolate and then I start to not do well. So I plan to... And do the Thanksgiving thing, keep up with my friends, clean, clean my apartment, tell my parents. Those are my plans. I have no plans to leave town. This is I've done this and I'm ready to face it, but I would love to go home. I think that's going to happen. Bless you. Okay. I think that's going to happen. As I said at the very, very beginning of this, whatever time we started ago, hours ago, um, you're not under arrest right now. Okay. Okay, but as you can imagine. Okay. Call you back in 30 minutes. Wetlawfer might not be under arrest right now, but that doesn't mean she will necessarily be free to do everything she has planned. That was my cousin. Um, as I said at the beginning, so you're not under arrest. Okay. But as you can imagine, an investigation you. like this yeah. is something that we've never dealt with. It's something right. that doesn't happen very often. It's okay. something that you rarely hear about. Right. Okay? I don't know of many, but you're not the first person to do this. Right. Okay? Having said that, we have a responsibility to protect the public. Right. Right? You know where I'm coming from when I say that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. You 
done some some things to some innocent people. Absolutely. Some pretty what people are Horrible gonna things. people are gonna have opinions of you and people Monster. are gonna right. Exactly. Um, having said that, there's something in the Criminal Court of Canada and this, this is usually results in someone being charged with a criminal offense and being placed on such a thing called an 810 peace bond. Okay. okay. And basically what an 810 peace bond is, is is kind of a promise given by your, or your word given to us, and it's a, a court document that's issued by a judge that puts you on certain conditions, to, uh, certain conditions limiting you from doing certain things, having certain things in your possession, attending certain locations, and if you were to breach those conditions, right. then you would be arrested and further charged with okay. breaching this, what's called an 810 peace bond. Okay. So basically, you've heard of a, restra a restraining order? Yes. It's similar to that. Okay. Okay. A lot of people call it restraining orders, but it's actually in Canada called an 810 peace bond. Okay. And uh, again, it just limits you from doing certain things, attending certain locations. Uh, it could be things like uh, still getting help for your mental health, um, your substance abuse, yes. surrendering your passport. Um, I have no passport. Not practicing as an RN. Yeah. Uh, not attending nursing homes, things like that. Yeah, okay. If that were an option, which, like I said, usually that occurs with people that are charged people or convicted of certain offenses. Right. That's part of their, their punishment sometimes. Okay. Would you be willing to enter into an 810 peace bond prior to being criminally charged? Absolutely. Okay. And do you understand what I mean by the 810 peace bond? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It means I have to do it or I come back and I'm in jail until everything else happens. I don't know what would happen if, if you were to breach it as far as jail and, and the consequences. Yeah. The only thing that I want to make sure that it's clear to you and, and that I'm make sure that I'm getting my point across is that it's basically a document that you're going to swear to uh, sign and uh, and uh, agree not to yeah. do certain things, not to have certain things in your possession. And right. I, and I'm saying I'm not saying that's going to happen right now. Okay. Because it has to go in front of the judge. Oh, okay. Okay. So it it's just an option that we're looking at because. As I said, we have the responsibility to protect the public. Yes, absolutely. Okay? That's why I want to know what your plans are. Yes. I want to know that you're going to go home and be supported by your family. Yes. I want to know that you're Cell phone will be charged at all times. Always on my body if you need me. I will be here any, if you need me to come here. I'll be here if you need me to wait for you to come and get me. I'll do it. I'll be totally committed. Okay. All right. I think we have your Do we have your cell phone number? Five one nine. Yeah. Five three two. Six four seven one. Okay. Home phone number is five one nine. Two nine zero. Zero seven two four. Okay. Parents phone number. Don't worry about that. I'll get that one. I'll get your parents phone number. Okay. Um. Okay. You understand what I what we just talked about? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because it's a very unique situation, right? Yes. Yeah, Where so you confess to, to certain things, yeah. and we have quite a bit of like work, as you can imagine, yeah. to um, piece this investigation together and see where we go from here. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of people that will consult in it and determine the final answer uh, of what your fate is. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, but I, I know that you're aware of the extent of what you've done. Yes. I know that you've verbalized and, and spoke about how you feel. And that obviously you can't take it back, but... You know. I'm relieved that I've confessed it. I feel sorry for the people that are not going to find out. Sorry doesn't say it. Yeah. They should, they should do that as a power of bigger than sorry. Yeah. Like, Diana, sorry or something. Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah. I yeah. really have to pee. I'm sorry. No problem. It is hard to watch Wetlaufer walk out of that room and be able to go home, knowing what she did. But Hergot was right when he said that her case was unique. It's almost unheard of to get a legitimate, voluntary confession to a crime of that magnitude, so there is a lot of paperwork and legal channels to go through to make sure they handle everything correctly and not damage their case by doing something wrong. Wetlaufer, for her part, seems fairly resigned to her fate. She knows she is guilty and there can be only one possible outcome. On June 26th, Wetlaufer was sentenced to eight concurrent life terms in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. She was held in the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Kitchener, Ontario. 
In March 2018, she was transferred from Grand Valley to an unspecified secure facility in Montreal to receive medical treatment.